All right, welcome everybody to the final set from uh, day number one in Hidden Cup 4. We'll have a Pope Leo the first versus Gonzalo Pizarro. We'll have a Mongols and Franks global ban. Um, Pope Leo will have Celts, Vikings, uh, Berbers, Slavs, Koreans, and Malians available. Pizarro will be playing with uh, Indians, Khmer, Japanese, Aztecs, Lithuanians, and an interesting Turks pick for the final one. Gonzalo Pizarro will be playing with Bypasses, Slopes as his home maps, and Mudflow for the first home map of Pope Leo, and Cup as the second one for him. Hideout will be the ban by Pope Leo, and Pizarro bans Gold Rush. With that, we will jump into game number one. So... We'll be using Capture H for this one as well. Capture H is a lot of new features over here. And I just want to show off the original colors because that could be a clue for many people. Although I feel like gray isn't something that any player likes to play in particular. There is no rules about the color selection, but you have to stick with uh, the same color for the entire set at minimum. And I think the entire tournament even. Now, for easier distinguishability, I'm actually going to switch Pope Leo to red. But you can still see his original color in a little number over here with seven gray. So we're going to have a Vikings play here from Pope Leo um, on the south as red. To the north, it's going to be Pizarro as Lithuanians in blue. A civilization that I really like, to be honest, in his matchup versus Vikings. The versatility is there. Um, in mid to late Castle Age, the Lithuanian skirmishers should have an upper hand over the Viking crossbows. So we'll see what the Vikings can do here. But Vikings feel a little bit one-dimensional. To me, it's also worth pointing out that the Relic Spawn is massively favoring Pizarro. If you take a look at the um, players over here, you will see Gonzalo having one Relic in this corner. This should be guaranteed for him. This is actually very easy to pick up as well. This one is definitely takeable, and so is this one. So I feel like the only Relic that's actually particularly close to Pope Leo is this one. Over here, um, we are going to have uh, Pope Leo dropping the Lumber Camp over here um, with one villager yeah. squeezed in between the Lumber Camp and the Woodland. That's not something that a lot of players do. So there will be a lot of visual clues to look at um, for uh, the players. And I will try to refrain from making too many guesses on the players' identities because I feel like um, that not, that's not necessarily the point of the entire thing. Although... It's inevitable that there will be guesses made by me as well. That's just the way Hidden Cup works out. So we'll have a free on Wood from both players. It's not surprising that Lithuanians are going for free on Wood. It is more surprising we're seeing free on Wood from uh, our Vikings player. And I wonder if that's actually a fourth Wood Voyager. Interesting, we have the board being weakened by the TC fire. Whereas on the other side, we'll also take a look if the boar is actually going to be targeted by TC Fire or not, because that can always be a strong clue towards the identity of a certain player. So, for now, it is Deer Push coming in here for Pizarro. And, uh, as I said, it's uh, somewhat unconventional to do six on sheep, three on wood, and then one villager bringing in the boar, and then a fourth one on wood. Usually, you just send four on wood by default. So... Old Deer Push coming in here for Pizarro, who probably wants to go for some very, very fast fuel age um, here with Lithuania. Something like maybe 19 pop scouts could be doable. Apparently, he's pushing the deer in the wrong direction because the deer is definitely going back. <laughs> oh, man. That's so unlucky for him. Um, so, apparently, Pizarro is having a bit of a trouble pushing in deer for himself. Um, so, neither of these civilizations are very, very unconventional on... Arabia, I would say. We have seen one player already today that actually went for um, Lithuanians on Arabia. I will try to make these series as spoiler-free as possible, but please be mindful that since the event is very short, only four days, and uh, because of the guessing, oftentimes uh, similar civilization selections or strategies need to be pointed out. I feel like... Um, it is pretty much inevitable that we are going to see some medium spoilers, at least, in terms of who picked certain civilizations on a given map. So that's just inevitable. That is the way that this tournament works. Normally, I would try to make all sets spoiler-free, but as I said, um, here, guessing is part of the game, not just for you, but for me as well. With that, indeed, that's 19 pops. Actually, it's a 20 pop scouts from Pizarro. Interesting decision to go for 20 pop, because with the Lithuanians and this many deer pushed in, I think you could have gone for the 8, 19 pop. I don't think it's necessary. Um, 
but uh, this way you're gonna have a standard 20 pop uh, scouts build but you're probably gonna have a lot of food in the bank for pizarro you see that this boar still holds 75 food and you also have one deer with 90 and one that was just finished so really um pizarro is gonna have a pretty nice food eco at the beginning of the game over here um surprisingly only has free on berries though that's probably part of the 20 pop build for him um, we will have uh, what appears to be a minute arms opening from Pope Leo. Makes sense if he assumes that his opponent is actually going to play um, scouts against him. Because uh, minute arms opening, especially with Viking men at arms that even have more HP, can be pretty devastating against the scouts. Given that you are Vought back at home, I feel like that's the condition that you have to apply over here. We haven't talked about the player's bases, but there's a nice gold man at the back for Pope Leo. He's got some good wood lines to work with. It depends on where he's walling his base, though. He could wall here, which would secure these two wood lines very, very easily for him. Alternative is that he walls here and here, but I feel like you probably want to wall here. It's a smaller amount of work, but it also depends on whether or not he sees that wood line, and he doesn't. And because he doesn't see this wood line, he's going to wall all the way here. Because if you have to wall to the edge, that's too much, so you probably prefer this wall. Had he seen this forest over here, he would wall like this, probably. Right side, we're gonna have some MBL level walls over here. Um, this is definitely a wall that um, some players wouldn't really make. A player like MBL definitely would consider such a thing. And uh, is that a Ford Voyager or is that just a range? It's just a range coming in for now. Stable coming in for um, Pizarro, who's going for some small and tight walls. It reminds me of the walls that Doubt has made in uh, King of Desert 3. Uh, we will have a relatively safe gold man over here for him, although it's not really amazing, to be honest, especially against archer civilizations. And the walls will be finished before the Mantarms really are able to do any damage. Although technically they could try sneaking past this house, so nothing prevents them from running past here. For now they will just try to bash their way through the walls. Um, over here um, we will have uh, no eco upgrades coming in here for Pope Leo. Is that Nikov? Hello? I'm just joking, but um, really eco upgrades timing is actually something that uh, we need to pay attention for. Scouts will pop out right now. The rules aren't set for Pope Leo just yet, so the scouts actually could do some damage. But I feel like these walls will be finished by the time the scouts arrive, although it's going to be tight. And the other side has a spearman, so I'm unsure how much damage these scouts can do. But it seems like the manatoms will be forced back for the time being, and we'll have a pretty early archer range coming in here. I assume it's just going to be skirmishers. Uh, because uh, there is no villagers being sent to gold right now from Pizarro. Still missing the eco upgrades is Pope Leo. It's not a surprise that he's missing horse color with an archer build. It, however, is a bit of a concern for him that he's missing even double backs, and uh, that's gonna be a very, 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 very close volling. Uh, just in time. He was very lucky that it wasn't one more tile, because he wasn't actually building it up. Like, all you need to do is just get a couple of hits on each tile to make sure that, um, you know, the scouts cannot immediately run past it. That was actually pretty close, and that's not something that he did do. Now there is an archer here as well, doing some harassment, supported by a spearman. But there is already a skirmisher with Lithuanians, so both the spearman and the archer are now in danger. It looks like the wolves will be finished for Pope Leo. And as I said, his double bit axe timing is disturbingly late. As we're gonna have uh, the first skirmish, as I said, it's enough to scare the archer away for a time being. This house is slowly going down. Um, no micro so far from red to try and fight the skirmisher. The skirmishers won't do much against the men at arms, but this is definitely forcing some idle time on Pizarro's eco. So far, Pizarro has been defending quite nicely, though. So, horse color coming in here first for Pope Leo. That's an interesting decision, but I actually like it. I think that if you have to choose between the two, you probably want to add horse color, although it depends on how many farms you have dropped before. I haven't seen um, how many farms were dropped before. If there was like more than four or five farms already, it doesn't matter. You know, you probably want to double bit eggs then. But if it was after, let's say, less than four farms, then it makes sense to go for horse color first compared to double bit eggs. Still, bit eggs missing is obviously not ideal for... Uh, or red player, considering that his opponent, as I said, because he went for the early, very, very food heavy play with the deer push and Lithuanians in general, allows him to squeeze in uh, Bidax, horse color as well. Pretty nicely, we'll have Fletching. Um, I think Fletching was cancelled here. So it seems like Pizarro doesn't want to commit to Fletching unless absolutely necessary. 
And there seems to be an opening there, but the skirmishers right now are... Is there an opening? It's it's hard to tell. There should be, right? Yeah, there should be an opening here. Scouts are now coming back. And it looks like Pizarro will actually reunite his forces so he can pick off the spearmen with his skirmishers. Um, this is going to be a very, very micro-intensive battle, but I like the spear and, or the scout and skirm play a lot better than this uh, man at arms archers play right now. Still no bit axe for Pope Leo. Starting to be nervous about that one. As for now, both players are actually steadily progressing towards Castage. A bit of a lead for Pope Leo um, in that regard, but that's no surprise with um, Vikings. Vikings eco is just absolutely bonkers. Man at arms coming in now. They're actually excellent at soaking up damage, especially these are Viking man at arms at 50 HP. And they're also pretty decent against scouts. And this was a good engagement for Pope Leo, if you ask me. Being able to pick off one scout with the uh, man at arms is a fairly reasonable trade at this point. You probably are trying to focus on saving your archers. But here's the deal as I said, um, I feel like the versatility actually favors Lithuanians here. I just don't think that uh, Vikings are versatile enough to match up against Lithuanians in mid castle age or so. So Vikings want to play with their crossbows and Lithuanian skirmisher defense will be nice against that. Obviously Vikings can go for their own knights, but I feel like that's still all right for Lithuanians because Lithuanians can just mix in their own knights as well. Castle age times will be very, very close for both players. First to click up is Pizarro and uh, it seems like Leo could also click up, but Leo is not doing it. Leo is a little bit low on gold, but he could have just four dropped it off. He actually was like 20 seconds later than he could have been. Goes for a stable, indeed, he's gonna mix in some knights. He tries to hide the stable from his opponents, so... Um, Pizarro is going to be unprepared, but I feel like when you're going for skirms as Pizarro, you should anticipate that the opponent is gonna mix in knights against you. Because it's almost guaranteed that you are going to encounter knights. So... Archers for now from a single range from Pope Leo, he's definitely gonna go for a crossbow upgrade. But um, even mixing in a couple of scouts here, that's not something that a lot of players do. Um, and uh, I think MBL is actually one of them that actually likes to do that. Um, with that, uh, the Mad Arms have been uh, cleaned up. And uh, for now, we have a free Voyager's lead for Pope Leo. He's 20 seconds behind compared to Castle Age. Uh, and uh, he also has 20 seconds less TC idle time. I think that pretty much was before. Uh, he clicked up to Castle There was some idle time over there on the TC that shouldn't really have happened. And it's gonna be a double stable knight's play. But here's the deal. As I said, um, especially with the Pizarro will be able to spot that. He sees one stable. I think he will just mix in his own knights. And I think I like Lithuanian knights plus Lithuanian skirms better than Viking knight plus Viking crossbows. You see that there is already bloodlines coming in for Pizarro. So he will definitely go for his own knights. He might even go for the standard double stable knights here, although he only is on one stable in general. So, we will see what the second production building is. He either goes for double range and elite skirm, or he's gonna go for multiple knights, but... No, it seems like he just wants to go for a fairly greedy boom here. So, second TC coming in, that's a nice position for now. And he isn't adding a second stable, nor a second range, no elite skirm upgrade. He's barely making any army, so... He's taking a significant risk here, playing with free TCs, um, and especially considering that his base is everything but secure, so crossbows could definitely pressure that gold mine. And uh, now there is bot king coming in, but no elite skirm, not really a lot of knights on the field, and I feel like for Pope Leo this is actually a good scenario. I would definitely consider going for a forward siege workshop here if you're Pope Leo, who's playing on one TC right now. And he's still far from adding additional ones. For now, he's gonna have the crossbows on the field, which will be able to deny this uh, wood line. Here comes Elite Skirm from uh, Pizarro. As we're gonna have a couple of knights on the field as well. Knights have plus one defense, but no um, bloodlines, obviously, because that is just missing for Vikings. But here come the knights, and as I said, I feel like Pizarro might have just underinvested into his uh, military production. See that he's on one range, one uh, stable. And his skirms have all been cleaned up just before they were upgraded to elite skirms, which is disaster, right? Now he's got two elite skirms on the field, and he only has a production of one range. So if the knights actually focus down the skirmishers, um, that is going to cause a lot of chaos in Pizarro's base. I think there is a hole right next to that archer range, so the crossbows could just run past. No ballistics on these guys just yet, TC number two coming in for Pope Leo, who's also mixing in some monks to get a couple of conversions on the opponent's knights. Um, his opponent is still on three TCs, <clears throat> but the military numbers aren't impressing me right now for um, Pizarro. It's only one range, one stable, 
and that's basically all. We're gonna have uh, plus one attack coming in for Popleo to increase the damage output of those knights and try to kill the skirmishers as fast as possible. Some farms had to be deleted here by Pizarro because um, they were harassed constantly by the crossbows. And uh, right now, Leo just wants to commit to taking down that range because that would pretty much limit his opponent's options to going for skirmishers, which would be a dream for um, the Vikings player. It also is worth noting that Pizarro is off from gold currently. He also doesn't have plus two defense on those skirms, so they're not super, super amazing. And he's just moving out to the other gold mine now. Leo is not sending any units to the other gold mines, which I think is a uh, something that he could definitely do. Just one knight on a gold mine like this would be extremely devastating. And he should know that his opponent will attempt to go elsewhere. He sees both of the secondary golds. Obviously, Pizarro can't go over here because that's like right in between the two players. So where else could Pizarro go? This gold mine. I think if you just look at this map, obviously there's a lot to focus on. But I think Pope Leo can and should anticipate his opponent sending voyages out to the other gold man over here because that is what makes sense for him. Um, three TCs will be up as well for Pope Leo. He's behind by 10 voyages, but he does have horse color in exchange. Or, uh, what is that? Hand card in exchange. He also has the better army, most likely. Um, currently holding this hill with the crossbows. No ballistics on those guys just yet. Starting to add voyages on stone. So we will see if we get a castle in the foreseeable future it is definitely possible because like you want to continue with arms as um the vikings but your opponent has some of the best skirmishers in the game so i don't think arbalest is a play i think what you actually want is berserk even then it's tricky because lithuanians have access to hand cannon here and this is what i was talking about once you know that your opponent is off from this gold mine, you just send a knight here to the other side and you kill a couple of voyagers. Leo has killed four voyagers from his opponent, lost a zero so far. Um, he's not going greedy, he isn't diving in deeper than he should. Just playing this one patient, denying this gold mine as much as possible, harassing the other one. And uh, if he had ballistics, this would be a lot more voyager kills as well from him. 23 already on food with Vikings farming is actually pretty uh, considerable already. Only two voyages on stone right now, makes me wonder if this is just for a, thir uh, for a fourth TC, because that would definitely be a possibility. This voyager is going to survive for now, as I jinx that, it is now a dead voyager. And now the knights will dive in. N Army numbers are still heavily favoring Pope Leo, and he's only behind by eight voyagers, and he also has hand cards, so I feel like eco-wise he's absolutely in this game. Um, right now his knights are possessing a plus one, plus two. And uh, it looks like Pizarro is doing some heavy, heavy market balancing over here, selling a lot of wood for gold. Remember that now he's two stables, tries to make knights, and those Lithuanian knights will be way better than the um, knights from uh, the Vikings. But this is what I was talking about. All that Pope Leo is doing right now is gold denial. And this is why I was a little bit skeptical about the one range, one stable play of Pizarro in early cast stage, because I don't think that his base actually justified a free TC boom, or even if it did, I feel like one of the TCs should have been on the gold mine to prevent such a disaster from happening, because right now, he's starving for gold. He doesn't have gold from this gold mine, and uh, he's also getting denied pretty heavily. I think this will be a cleanup eventually, although I think this is still winnable for Leo. He doesn't have bloodlines, but he's got plus one, plus two, whereas his opponent has only plus one defense and bloodlines. But there is also Monk coming in, you have the hill advantage, and we already have a pikeman being mixed in here by Pope Leo. Eventually that's gonna turn into Berserks, and it should turn into Berserks. Um, we're gonna have a Monastery just now coming in for Pizarro to try and get some lakes for himself. But honestly, at this pace, even this mining camp could go down, which would be a further annoyance for Pizarro. Knight will get deleted before the monk could get the conversion. And the Voyager count is also very, very even as well. So the free TC play didn't really work out for Pizarro. He wasn't able to secure any kind of Voyager lead from it. Part of that comes from the fact that Pope Leo killed 11 Voyagers from his opponent. Whereas he didn't lose a single one of them. So he's already picking up relics as well. In fact, he's picked up three relics. And um, whoever Pope Leo is, his macro is on point. Many, many players wouldn't have gone for relics even against Lithuanians this early. I have actually seen so much of that happening in the qualifiers. The players just ignore relics against Lithuanians and it's very, very tilting. Um, these knights still do not have any upgrades other than uh, plus one defense and bloodlines. This, I think, is now a fight that Pizarro is gonna be slowly winning, but there is pikemen being mixed in. These knights are still probably better in quality. There is monks supporting. 
and I mean, there is knights running around here as well. 17 gold right now for Pizarro, and he's down to just 7 knights against 13 knights, 7 crossbows, a couple of pikemen. And behind this one, um, Pope Leo is collecting relics, looking at Pope Leo's scouting that's actually pretty decent-ish as well. I feel like, from what we have seen from Pope Leo, very, very clean macro, um, overall nice decision making. I feel like we have a big fish here, so I'm not, I'm not sure. In fact, I'm not even remotely close to telling who this player could be, but um, I feel like whoever it is, Pope Leo is most likely a top 8 player, as we have a fairly decisive victory over here in the favor of the Pope. We will have the first home map of Pizarro coming in, which is um, Bypass or Slopes Vikings. A victory for Pope Leo with that. Gold Denial was the name of the game over there. Lithuanians will be lost for Pizarro. And uh, we will jump into game number two over here. And we're going to Slopes over here with a Berbers versus Khmer matchup. I feel like... If I was a player playing Slopes, I would play Khmer. Not a lot of pros did that, but there's a lot of things to love about Khmer on this map. If you want to play just passive and not move out for a fish, you will be able to go for uh, a decent farming equ and probably catch up with the opponent. Um, even if the opponent has the fish and hunt on the outside. Or if you want to go to the outside, you can actually make a house here and jump into the house if you get pushed with your voyagers. That's also something that is worth looking into, as we're gonna have Pizarro playing his Khmer in blue on the right. Left side is gonna be Pope Leo as red. Once again, he actually chose gray, but for better visibility, we're actually doing this one with red. So looking at the bases of the players over here real quick, we do have a relatively well volleyball map for Pizarro. Even more important, this gold mine is quite safe, so is this stone mine. So if you war here, war here, um, it takes some walling, but a lot of safe resources would be available for Pizarro. So he's got double wood lines at the back that would be super safe. The stone, the gold, this is a very, very good map for Pizarro. Other side, we do have, um, interestingly, a piggy that's already scouting the pond over here. Uh, I wonder why he had to venture this far out. Um, Pope Leo's base is equally decent, I would say. Wood at the back is safe, easy wall off. This is actually a tricky part to wall off, I'll talk about that in a moment, but... Stone and gold are relatively secure over here. And as I said, the real question is um, how are you going to protect these berries? Because you don't want to go all the way out here. So these berries could be a little bit exposed. We're probably just going to see um, the berries being used as part of the wall. Both of these civilizations have the option to go for a scout's play or an archer play. Um, probably... Scout's play is more likely from the Khmer player, but you can never underestimate an archer's play possibility from him. He is free on wood though only, so there is a bit of a clue that we are probably going to see scouts from our Khmer player. And it looks like he's sending out voyagers one by one for the pawn. I don't like this, because if the red scout would be here, this would be that voyager. You at least have to escort your scout, or escort your voyager with a scout. Um, it also seems like um, Blue wasn't able to find those piggies. Oh, that's so unlucky for Blue. Pizarro actually missed out on the piggies in this dark patch, and that means that Pope Leo is gonna come forward, and he will be happily taking away two piggies from his opponent right away. We will see if he actually pulls the trigger on trying to lame that boar. And so far, it seems somewhat unlikely, and it looks like we'll have uh, both players sending out their voyagers to the pond for now. Obviously, you open with shortfish here for both players, because... Uh, well, shortfish is still better than uh, the hunt. The only save that you actually go for hunt with on this map in first place is Mongols. So it looks like Pizarro is actually able to take back his piggies. He found them being lamed and he actually finds them as well. We'll be able to scout the opponent and uh, we will have Pizarro not garrisoning his TC to kill the boar. That's always a clue. Um, on the other hand, I am fairly certain that Pope Leo did because none of his voyagers actually lost a single bit of HP. So there is very, very few people that actually do not um, jump into TCs. And the first person that actually comes into my mind is Doubt. 
And I feel like it's absolutely not impossible that we're looking at doubt for Pizarro. As I said, I will try to stay away from making a lot of predictions. But um, you have to consider the fact that the way he voted in the first game is reminiscent of Doubt's gameplay. Um, he doesn't like to garrison villagers and weaken the board with the TC. So there is a lot of things to think about in here. And uh, on the other side, we are going to have uh, Pope Leo coming with 20 pop. That should be a scout build. 20 pop on the other side is also going to be a scout's play. So, very, very similar builds, but it seems like we might have a slightly different execution from Pizarro. He will send out a couple of villagers for the other pawn as well, whereas that is not something that his opponent is doing. I think Leo is playing fairly standard meta over here for now, as uh, I like really the potential of uh, Pizarro getting some extra fishing eco for himself. It's dangerous, but if there is one save that I would love this to play with, it's Khmer. And you see what I mean by this. You can jump into this house with Khmer Voyagers, so even if you get pushed by scouts, you won't lose your Voyagers immediately. The only way that this could be dangerous is if there is Minute Arms coming, because Minute Arms can kill houses really fast. Um, scouts won't kill houses that fast. So if you jump into that house, it's going to be more than enough time for uh, Pizarro to react to scouts attacking this house. So this is a very, very nice game plan from him. And as I said, this is exactly the way I would play this map. So you get the extra food and you would actually also be able to stay safe with your villagers. Khmer isn't necessarily the best civilization when it comes to like late Imperial scenarios. And this map has the tendency to go into Imperial in many cases. But I feel like the potential to jump into houses and uh, overall the strong farming eco is a nice combination for Khmer on this map. So with that, um, we are going to have uh, the stable coming up here for Pope Leo. Um, he runs out of uh, fish, so he's going to go for the hunt. Whereas on the other side, we still have a bit of a fish here for Pizarro. But um, one thing that's actually very, very good for him is that I don't think that Pope Leo knows about this forward position over here. So Leo will probably try to pressure this side. Pizarro is playing with some fairly expanded walls so to say he's not really taking well he's taking his time to wall himself off but he's not really rushing walls he also went for the straight scouts play from Khmer but I'm not necessarily a fan of this on such a map the problem with this build is that um if you don't make spearman and that's a very very interesting mill very few players would drop a mill like that very very few players would do drop a mill like that the reason why you drop it like this, I will talk about that in a moment as we have the Scouts and Spears arriving, and here is the Khmer benefit. The problem that the Khmer are facing here, or at least more specifically, the build order that Pizarro is using, is that um, without Spearman you won't be able to decide Scout engagements. So Scout and Spear always beats standard Scout, and uh, one of the reasons why oftentimes you see players opening with the Deer um, first, even though the shorefish is actually a more efficient food source is because that way the opponent can't lame the deer because you can't lame the shorefish so you want to probably consume the deer on the outside as fast as possible to prevent that from being lamed and yeah the scouts as a pure unit is nice but you just can't take direct engagement and you see that he just lost three huntables over here and the same could be the fate on the other side if Pope Leo finds this so there is very very few people that would actually place a mill like that I don't even have anyone on my mind, but I can see, like, players like, let's say, MBL or um, Hera, they wouldn't actually play some um, mill like that. There is some players, however, that actually consider this one a better one, and the reason why is because there is less villager bumping when they are actually taking these berries. Obviously, these two will be further away, and that's going to cause a lot more walking, but this is less villager bumping, and have I mentioned that... Um, these Huntables will just be picked off by the Spears. That's a disaster for Pizarro and nice reactions really from Pope Leo. He just needs to kill the Huntables here with the Spearman and he is really punishing Gonzalo Pizarro for not going for a single Spearman. I feel like in 1v1 the straight stable play from Khmer isn't really legitimate. It is great in team games where you don't expect the pocket player to make Spearman anyways, but it is uh, kind of bad, I think, in 1v1, especially if in Scout Wars. 
if it's um, scouts versus archers, it's doable. But um, simple scouts die to spearmen so, so easily that you need to have something that deals with the spearmen, um, which could be archers, but obviously you can't go scouts, scouts and archers right at the beginning of Feudal Age. And these voyagers also running back, they will be taking the downhill's disadvantage. Nice move from Pizarro, saving those voyagers though. And Pizarro only lost um, one voyager so far, so that's actually pretty decent considering the fact that he got both of his sides pushed. He got a nice little extra eco from the hunt and fish, but overall I feel like um, the efficiency was there for Pope Leo. And uh, you also have to consider that um, Pope Leo has uh, left three Ibexes out there. So Leo was like, okay, I'm gonna move out. I'm gonna grab some extra food from this, but I won't really commit much to that. I don't risk it. So Leo is definitely one of the players that plays a little safer. He's not really liking gambles. He just wants to play as safe as humanly possible. Um, you saw that um, he didn't go for a YOLO siege workshop. Uh, well, not YOLO, but he didn't go for a super aggressive siege workshop in a previous game as well. Instead, when he felt like he has the advantage, he just went to um, add two more TCs and just play the eco-heavy approach. So it seems like um, Leo is definitely one of the less aggressive players overall. So with that, Leo is um, clicking up to Castle Age right now, shortly followed by Pizarro. This is where Pizarro could actually start shining with Khmer, but he has to do so with archers, I believe. Like, he's gonna have a crazy strong food eco, but I think he needs to go archers. And the reason why is because if he goes knights, the Berber will just overrun him with um, cheaper camels. Indeed, there is already a second stable coming in for Pope Leo. We'll see if he actually has a third stable. It's very possible that he goes for an uh, aggressive um, Berber play, but I would think that based on what we have seen from him in the first game, that he went for a little bit more eco-heavy approach, I don't think he's gonna go for triple stable knights, he's just gonna go standard double stable, probably mixing camels as well, and uh, just go for additional TCs whenever possible. So he's gonna play a little bit more passive, not go super aggro. With that, um, skirmishers will be holding against the archers for now. It's just a couple of skirms to hold off this force for a time being. Not really something that um, he's gonna commit a lot to. So you see, he's got no upgrades on those skirms. It's just a matter of making sure that Pizarro can do a lot of damage with this. I'm fairly certain there is a hole in between the house and the stable though. We'll have to see in a moment, I assume, because that wall is likely going down. There is a 30 seconds advantage though for Pope Leo into Castle Age here, so with that the first knights will be coming out and indeed Pizarro is going to disengage, so that's a nice move over there from Pope Leo though. He does have his plus one defense and he's got bloodlines, so intercepting those archers is actually very very valuable. Killing two archers at this stage is great because um, Pizarro probably wanted to go for crossbows and once again Pizarro is making just one stable, one range. This is very, very interesting. He feels to be under-investing into army quite heavily. And that was the tendency in the first game as well. So it is for this one. Just simply not bringing in um, enough beef to his army. He's once again going for free TCs. This is basically copy-paste the same game plan that he has done in the previous game. And he got punished for that one pretty hard. Khmer is great for booming. I totally give him that, but I feel like, once again, especially on such an open map, this could be punished really hard. There is going to be free TCs for Pizarro, protecting the key resources. Although, once again, um, the knights could actually just start running around and start killing villagers. That's the problem that um, Pizarro is facing right now. Obviously, the big hit could be here on this wood line, or the farming eco could be the trouble of some part. For Pizarro, for now, he's got enough crossbows. Um, to push this one back, and it looks like we're gonna have a retreat from uh, our red player, who's expanding his base a little bit uh, more than his opponent is doing so, so he's gonna have the DC up to this absolutely wonderful spot, right on the gold mine and on the wood line, this is an absolutely beautiful spot for uh, Pope Leo, as he's playing with standard double stable knights, not really mixing in camos against the knights, he's just trying to count on his superior numbers and cheaper unit cost. Pizarro never went for a single upgrade for those knights. He's got crossbows with what is um, just plus two attack, no ballistics, no tumbling whatsoever. The eco upgrades are in for Pizarro and it seems like Pizarro just wants to 
drag this game out to a post-imperial scenario and just stomp his opponent in late in because if you look at these upgrades barely making military not investing a lot into upgrades but going bow so heavy blow at this stage this is a very very eco heavy play and he just pretty much wants to boom here three tcs with chimera consistent to voyager production we got a big boomer over here for pizarro third tc is coming in for pope leo but needless to say um Khmer boom is gonna be way better than the berberus boom so I feel like Pope Leo has to do damage here with the Knights. Um, otherwise, he could be in trouble. With that, Knights are now coming in for Pizarro. I like this move from Pope Leo. He sends four Knights to clean up the three Knights over here. He's got plus two defense and bloodlines. His opponent has nothing, so this should be an easy cleanup. And uh, nice quick pause over there. That's going to be a forward siege workshop from Pope Leo. Trying to bash his way through the walls for now. And... Uh, I feel like I like the free TC play plus for Siege Workshop. If you can afford it, I have some doubts if um, Leo can actually afford this one. But I think he's doing the right thing. He realized that his opponent is just booming. So he's going to still try to apply pressure as much as possible with a forward Siege Workshop. But he will also be adding free TCs. But there is already a 13 Voyager's lead. So Pizarro's boom here is crazy. And that was probably the game plan in the previous game as well. But... Honestly, I don't even know if any of these players would risk a free TC crazy boom like that. Like, this makes guessing very very hard because I think Pizarro is doing something that not a lot of players would do. In fact, I don't even know any of these players um, would ever do such a thing. Like, just going for a full um, super greedy free TC boom. And now it's gonna be a pikeman play um, from uh, Pizarro. Could be pike and scorpion, pike and ram. Um, I feel like that's something that I can justify, even though there might be an overchop here soon, so the knights could potentially run in. But I feel like you kind of need to start adding pikemen now. You don't have to do an awful lot to keep these guys away, but you have to do something. Because um, just playing with a free TC boom will actually get punished eventually. Like, at latest with a castle drop. I feel like if you're Pope Leo, you actually should be considering that. Um, it looks like this soldier actually dropped the siege drop in the middle of the map. Trying to pick off the crossbows and the monk with a mangonel. Three TCs for both players, as I said, but it's a 16 Voyager's lead for Pizarro. It's a sick boom, and I assume this was the plan for the entire game. Whoever Blue is, Blue's got a macro. Blue's got a great macro. I just don't know who would be crazy enough to go for a full free TC boom on, on this map. I feel like that, that just sounds so, so dumb. Now, he needs to be careful still. 17 knights with reasonable upgrades. Plus one, plus two. Mangano is also supporting. There is pikemen coming out. The pikemen have no upgrades whatsoever. With Mangano support. Knights as well. Knights jump on the monks. Monks go down without getting, I think, any conversions. And uh, have I mentioned that this is a boom that could be seriously punished here? I think I might be right about that. Because now, the absolute carnage is going to happen inside the base of Pizarro here. Pizarro is trying to get Pikeman on the field, but I mean, the idle time that he's going to suffer from is going to be crazy. Gets a battle elephant out. But I think the biggest problem right now is that the Pikeman will just keep chasing the knights. And all that Leo needs to do is just run around and try to kill as many villagers as he can and idle the eco of his opponent. Now, most of those knights actually went down, so it wasn't perfect for um, Leo. But I mean, he's got the monks supporting. The monks will also help you convert a couple of pikemen, which kind of lowers the amount of pikemen you're going to encounter on the field. But more importantly, heal the knights, which is going to be extremely important because you want to keep them alive as much as possible. So now it is only a 14 Vulture's lead for Pizarro, still considerable eco lead. But you also have to account for the fact that he's got 46 minutes of village idle time compared to just... 12 seconds or 12 seconds to all minutes now Pope Leo has a lot more TC idle time and that's something that we have to consider as well Pope Leo's macro isn't um, as sharp as the opponent's macro here so one of the reasons why he's still behind by 12 Voyagers is because he's got um, a lot more TC idle time and it's even amounts of TC's um, there is a fourth one coming in just now for Pizarro but three TC's for both players but he has a lot more TC idle time so his efficiency wasn't really there a mangonel is lost in this engagement but Pikeman once again getting cleaned up, and it's still an awful lot of Voyager idle time for our red play or for our blue player. And if you take a look at um, Pope Leo's stone count, he's actually getting close to dropping a castle here. We'll have two mangonels shelling this TC for the time being. 
with two scorpions supporting uh, this should be enough to keep the pikemen away for the time being and once again it's just full pikemen from pizarro i'm starting to dislike his position very very heavily here because his boom is crazy but once again he seems like he's just getting punished for this one and this is why i said that i feel like none of these players should and would risk going for a full greedy free pc boom over here pikemen will fall out right now but i mean you need one good ground attack with those manganoles they will miss it um, I think you're gonna need another mangonel hit though. You have to fire. Shoot with the mangonels, man. You have to shoot the pikemen. Now, still, these are plus one, plus two knights. I think the decisive factor here is that those pikemen barely have any upgrades. Only plus one attack isn't really enough. Even amounts of knights will destroy even amounts of uh, pikemen. So, like 20 knights versus 20 pikemen is won by knights. Especially if the knights have plus one, plus two. Support from siege weapons as well. Potentially monks as well, healing. It's also a huge factor, and as I said now, Pope Leo is 10 on stone, so um, Pope Leo is soon going to drop a castle, and I feel like the castle's position is going to tell a lot about the personality of Leo. He could go for a more defensive-oriented castle, he could just drop a castle right away over here and say, okay, out of my game, pleb. Um, it looks like Pizarro is also planning to drop a castle himself, only 5 on stone though, so it's going to take quite a lot of time until he piles up the stone needed for it, but he's probably thinking about a defensive castle against this mangano push and look at that imp from pope leo that is absolutely crazy um i am really convinced by the gameplay of pope leo and i feel like um whoever it is i'm starting to feel it's definitely the top eight player so far in terms of execution um although he had some pc idle time over here as well so it wasn't a perfect macro but um he seems to be a very very good aggressive player out there Hard to say who this could be, but one of the people that actually comes into my mind could be Vivi. Who is not necessarily amazing with a macro, but very very good when it comes to aggressive gameplay. Although he played um, fairly safe in the previous one, and that's something that we also have to consider. Um, so Manganos once again pushing this TC down, Imperial Age halfway in, and Pope Leo could drop almost two castles now. He is having 25 knights against 21 pikemen over here. Voyager count is in the favor of um, Pizarro by 8, but that's not an enormous lead by any means. So, that's definitely workable. Mangano is missing the shot, and the Mangano micro wasn't amazing over here by any means. For Pope Leo, tries to get some nice Mangano hits in though, and really the monks are helping an awful lot. Healing the knights, that kind of lowers just the amount of resources lost. And, uh, where is value spent destroyed? Um, there was actually a tap for that. They might have moved it to the stat screen, but I don't want to switch away from this point of view right now because we have a big fight happening here. But I feel like when Leo reaches Imperial, Pizarro is going to tap out because he's nowhere close to imping. Once again, there is some macro issues for Pope Leo, but he seems to be a very, very good aggressive player out there and now we're gonna have fletching it's going to be for camera archers um pizarro not uh, quitting just yet but i mean there's a castle in his face that's going to deny two gold mines by the way and camel archers will just absolutely tear apart um the pikemen um a little bit sloppy to lose all those manganoles to the pikemen and the knights over there but um first the trap and it's actually going to turn into a cavalier play i think the fletching was originally meant to be um for camel archers but at this point, I think that Leo understands that um, he's better off if he's making traps with a castle. Second castle coming in here to contest this one. I wonder if he actually knows about that, though. Um, he knows about the castle, so this is actually a very nice castle position. Cavalier going to be on the way. Um, there is plus two attack now coming in for uh, Pizarro, who defends off against a uh, nice little raid from leo leo now has a free villagers deficit only and uh it looks like cheap berber cavalry is gonna be the name of the game eventually it should be camel archers because your opponent could just go for hubs but for now it is going to be heavy cab simply i like the decision that you bring up the tribe over here so you don't just fire from downhills you actually go up here and that means that you're even ground with the castle um it looks like imperial age is coming in as well for pizarro so it's not a completely lost cause and i mean look at this pope leo is even going for that relic that is so so viper-esque and i actually said this in the previous game that pope leo put a lot of emphasis on uh, collecting relics 
At first, I attributed that to the fact that he was up against Lithuanians, and against Lithuanians you always try to focus relics, but look at Pope Leo. He has three relics inside those monasteries already, and he even tried going for that. Not a lot of people would actually move out for that. And really, the first person that comes into my mind is Viper. Most players would just say, okay, I don't really care about this relic because that's too far out and my opponent probably will just kill my monk anyways. But there are a couple of players that are risking the life of monk to try and join a relic away. Viper is one of those. Three cat traps shelling this castle. It's nearly impossible for Pizarro to keep it up. He still has uh, 50 seconds to go onto the Imperial. He will have a decent pikeman when he reaches him. But as I said, eventually we're going to see... Um, what is this? Range is coming in. I hope it's not janitors. Could be hand cannon as well, or could be champion. Berbers have fully upgraded champion, so when you're up against that many pikemen, might as well go for the Berber champion. It takes quite a lot of time to tech into, as um, you see the drawback of the pikemen play. They're just slow moving. Um, the pikemen are all on the left side, and just a couple of cavalier are doing so much damage. You see 37 voyagers killed. This is not even a remotely close series, or at least this game's 38 voyagers killed, zero. On the other side, as we have uh, Kasba coming in, so it's going to be the Camel Archer play at the end of the day. And really, so far, Leo has been stomping Pizarro over here. The first Voyager kill just now comes in. This lady gets poked down by the pikeman. But look at all this carnage that is happening. And yeah, it's gonna be Khmer Habadir, it's going to be Khmer um, Light Cav. But I mean, Pizarro's eco is getting absolutely shredded. That being said, switching into Camel Archers is uh, quite a difficult tech switch. It takes quite a lot of time, even with Kasba. Um, you only have three castles, and this castle is actually pretty far out, so it's going to take some time until the Camel Archers reach the front line. And there's a lot of those Habadiers on the field, so you really have to ask the question if Champion Switch would have been a little bit more legitimate. Now we're going to see that coming in, but that takes quite a time now as well. Still, Camel Archers will actually be pretty decent dealing with these Habadiers, especially because the Habadiers do not have plus 4 defense. So, it's not going to be ideal for Pope Leo, but he still has a pretty decisive lead. And these Cavaliers can run into the opponent's base anytime. So when these Habadiers get cleaned up, um, you see that there's 40 Habadiers for Pizarro on the field. Out of that, 22 is on the field here. So that means that if they get cleaned up, the Cavalier will have a completely untouched opportunity to run into the opponent's eco. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Cavalier will try to hit the core of the opponent's eco, which is where a significant portion of the food eco is located. Although most of it was transferred to left side. It's worthwhile to know that this castle was saved eventually, which is a bit of a miracle. At the end of the day, heavy camel archer coming in uh, in a moment. Still, these habiliers will get cleaned up and uh, look at this distribution of the cavalier once again from Pope Leo. 49 voyagers killed as opposed to 2. His opponent is still in this game though, in terms of uh, eco, that's the amazing thing. So, champions could really work out. What you have to keep in mind though is that Khmer light cap spam could be very devastating in post imp when um, the players start running out of gold. And that's definitely a possibility for uh, Pizarro right now who has one relic inside the monastery. Because he lost two of these gold mines over here, I'm fairly certain that Pizarro is running out of gold soon. He still has one deposit over here with about 2k gold, but that's all he has and after that light cap spam should be working, but I feel like Leo is once again one step ahead. Now it's 28 elite camel archers, soon champions, there is still a reasonable amount of cavalier on the field. Hussar is already in, so the Hussar raids will actually start commercing as well. And really there is just not a simple, simple counter-attack from um, Pizarro. There is going to be another defensive castle which will protect this side of Leo's base. Leo's got some overchops here, but I don't think that he cares about those right now. Um, not necessarily an amazing engagement with the camel archers over here. He will lose a couple of them, but he just had the numbers advantage. And he decided that, okay, I can afford to take that fight. Lost a couple of camel archers, but didn't have to micro in exchange. Played barding on the way for Pizarro as he's trying to raid his way back into the game with Hussar. But it's 9 in military against 44. And Pope Leo... I feel like this is not a super, super clean play from Leo, um, especially the idle times on TCs is um, a little bit high, but I'm feeling like he's just absolutely annihilating his opponent right now. So still it's 62 Voyagers killed to 9, um, he's able to raid everywhere, look at this, he's just killing the trap boy here on this side, he's pushing in on this side, he's got uh, Hussars on this side, really 
his late game seems to be really on point you already have the hussar coming in and they will just take that down and right now um leo is just mopping the floor with uh pizarro to be honest pizarro's got the will count but that's all that is going for him 144 population but 128 of that is voyagers a castle will be stopped over here and the traps will also be taken down um, Trebs slowly annihilating the starting base of Pizarro. I just don't see how Pizarro could come back into the game. And indeed, um, Pope Leo takes a swift second victory here. I feel like um, the free TC play, like the full free TC boom without making any reasonable amount of army for Pizarro might have been a little too greedy. But it also comes to the fact that it seems like um, Leo is one class above Pizarro's skill level as things stand based on the first two games. Oop. So, with that, um, we are going to have uh, Berbers gone for Pope Leo and Khmer gone for Pizarro. Pizarro's other home map is going to be Bypass. So, let's see what um, our Conquistador can do on Bypass over here. And we have a Turks play. I don't think that a lot of people have played um, Turks in the qualifiers. On this map there is only one i remember that is comparable it was the bloodless who obviously lost against accm um in the first round of qualifiers that actually played turks on hideout this is a very very small clue but maybe accm decided that hey turks could be strong on such a map as i said it's a small clue i feel like um turks is a legitimate civilization over here. I can see fast castle Janissaries being particularly devastating over here. I feel like Turks is a very underrated fast castle, um, unique in its civilization. We will see um, what Pizarro and Pope Leo has in store for us as we will jump into game number uh, three here. Pope Leo with a match point. This is the final home map of uh, Pizarro. Pizarro is going to be playing Turks versus Slavs from Pizarro. Slavs also have a lot of options over here. Um, could be monk-based strategies through the middle. Could be siege-based strategies. Could be just a more eco-focused approach. But I feel like Turks here is actually a very, very good civilization. I don't think that a fast really? imp is something that you should gamble on. But this map is just screaming for a fast castle Janissaries plus Mangonal play. It is just a so so strong play in general when the two players are close to each other. Janissaries will be able to pick off monks relatively easily because of their high range. Janissaries are able to take down the opponent's mangonos very easily, unlike, let's say, conquistadors. The mangonos obviously will be there to assist with the siege, but Janissaries themselves actually deal a lot of damage against buildings. It's 10 per hit, I believe, on a town center. So, a fast castle Janissary play would definitely be a very, very reasonable one for... Uh, player like um like pizarro so with that we're gonna have the first elephant reno coming in for pizarro once again not weakening the elephant with the tc i think that the leo is doing um what he's supposed to as uh he is actually going to be um, walling this off with houses. And uh, it seemed like we're going to have the same play from Piz Leo attempted here. He was um, walling off his base and then Pizarro came in, tries to wall him off from the middle. And then Leo sends two villagers, forces the opponent back and eventually walls off the opponent. Why is it so important to wall off the opponent like that? It's because... That means that there is an additional layer of pass side to get through it. More importantly, it gives you information. So you know what the opponent actually wants to push you with. That's the key part. Now, it looks like Pizarro is not actually going to play um, Janissaries over here. There's a Barax coming in. And it's a 25 Voyagers up, which feels a little too early for a Janissary play, unless it's actually a Super Gassy Jenny play. And um, I believe it's going to be Light Cav at the end of the day. Now that we're actually on pace towards castle age we're going to slow down and it's an interesting play going for um light calf here sort of uh, unprecedented now if you feel that your opponent wants to monk and siege push you light calf with turks is a reasonable idea it would be good against archers as well but it's unlikely we're going to see archers from slavs um so it's just one scout right now 
for um, what is just going to be basically vanilla scouting. I wonder what Pizarro's plan is here. Um, one thing is sure, Popplio wants to play the long game here. He's actually going to stonewall off his opponent. And he will probably just try to go for a much um, more reasonable boom. You see that he's adding one vultures to stone. After making the stonewall, it kind of makes sense. Because you want to make sure that you can actually drop two additional pieces in Castlage. Castlage stands will be fairly identical for both players over here. It looks like Leo didn't skip Loom. Neither did Pizarro. As Pizarro is indeed adding a couple more um, scouts over here. And I feel like both players might be playing for a long game here. Um, this is definitely going to favor Pizarro though with the Light Cav. That he's going to get in a couple of moments. So Light Cav upgrade for free helps quite a bit here for Pizarro. And if it's just, you know, scouts poking and probing on the outside, it's going to turn into a relic collection war. Uh, each corner has one relic, but the final relic is here in the middle, which is almost guaranteed for Pope Leo, since Pizarro isn't able to access this one. This might have been the original plan for Pizarro, that might have been the reason why he tried to war off the opponent, is because he wanted one guaranteed relic for himself. Protects this relic with a spearman. And I guess he wants to contest this relic as much as possible. Fast Boso coming in here for him. Monastery on the way as well before anything else. So. Second TC first for um, Pope Leo. As he's going to add a Monastery as well himself. We are going to have uh, just uh, two scouts on the field. But there is also going to be a Knight coming in for Pope Leo. I think that this is not something that a lot of people would do. I will actually come back to this in a moment. But mixing a knight like this is always dangerous because your opponent could have monks on the field. In this case, it's a reasonable decision because there is no way the opponent's monk is already over here. Um, it takes quite a lot of walking time. But as I said, many players wouldn't mix in knights here in fear of getting them converted. But I know one player, once again, I'm trying to keep away from uh, making a lot of predictions. But in uh, Lords of the Arena, I believe, or it might have been the last Clown Cup, Viper actually was one of the players that mixed in a couple of knights in a situation like this on an arena map. And he was counting on that knight just not getting converted. So he was making sure that he's able to control that unit all the time. And he's just avoiding conversions with that. And in that case, that's perfectly fine. It's a risky move, but it can work out. I'm not saying this is Viper, but... I have some Viper vibes with Pope Leo, to be honest, so far. Other side is more interesting. We have a 2TC play here for Pizarro. I'm going for the Relic Collection for now. As uh, we will have 3TC Bloom over here for Pope Leo. Um, he's got Slavic Farming in his hand as well. Gets um, Double Buddha, or even Boso, and Horse Color early for himself. I like this move as well, Healing up the Scout. So he's not actually losing that in vain. Nice decision over there from him. First Relic and second Relic will be coming in very soon for Pizarro. As uh, Pope Leo actually wants to go for this Relic, but that's not going to be an option. He will actually see this. He knows exactly that that Relic has been picked up. Because you see that the monk that was tasked on that Relic actually stopped walking forwards. So you know that that Relic has been picked up. And it's raised the question whether or not this monk will actually be able to secure this Relic. Because had Pope Leo gone for this relic immediately, I think he would be already back at home. But now the light cap is coming yeah. forward, and the light cap is actually going to pick off that monk very, very easily. One, two hits, and the next monk could also go down very, very soon over here. For now, it's a Spearman Knight protecting this part of the base um, for Pope Leo. And we're going to have double monks coming forward from uh, Pizarro to actually secure that relic. Another monk gets picked off and this gives a chance for um, Pizarro to even go for this relic. It would be a disaster for Leo if he wasn't able to pick up a single relic from the outside. He's gonna have this one guaranteed, but he wanted to go for the greedier approach and wanted to go for this one. He could have secured this one, I think. Now he's getting close to taking this, so he will still be at least on two relics, but it could even be three. Right now he only has a one Voyager lead, uh, as both players are on three TCs, Ecos are fairly comparable, no wheelbarrow on either side. So, who do I like in post-Imperial? That's a tricky scenario. Because I feel like Slavic hub and siege is always tough to counter. And there is no onagers from Turks. I feel like it depends whether or not the Slavs can time a good hub and siege push well enough. Uh, well executed hub and siege through the middle actually is able to win your game on this map. But the timing is extremely important. 
because if not, Light Cav and um, Janissary should be able to beat it if there is not enough ramps supporting or not enough Habadiers. But the idea is that the Hub and Siege works against the Turks if... Um, like, you need something with the Turks that destroys rams. And the best thing the Turks can do against that is potentially Light Cav or their own rams or maybe Bombard Cannons, but Bombard Cannons seem somewhat unlikely. So, that's not really a possibility. Turks don't have onagers. Turks do have their own siege ram, so that could be an option. But, like, what are the ideal units for Turks in post-imp? Cav Archer, Janissaries potentially. I just don't see either of those stopping a hop and ram push. Especially the ram part is the problematic part for Turks to deal with. It looks like um, Leo will actually add the TC number 4 there as well. He's already on free. 64 Voyagers for both players. TC number 4 is already up though. Poor Pizarro getting a market up just now. He has a lot of wood in the bank. That's why he's probably getting that up. 30 on food versus 27. And we also have quite a lot of Voyagers on stone for Pope Leo. Makes me wonder if uh, he's thinking about a castle... You can't build on this um, running sand, so that's not really an option to drop a castle here. Surprising is the fact that um, Pope Leo hasn't picked up the other relic in the middle. I don't know what he's doing, but he could have easily picked up that relic by now. Uh, he might have had just the monks on the outside, just trying to make sure that he's not getting pushed really hard. Although I feel like he could have just picked those up. I don't think it was uh, that impossible. With that, that's a kind of heavy blow coming in pretty soon. Nice poke on the light cap, the other one gets converted. And uh, at the end of the day, Pope Leo is still fine. Looking at the resources, he's still far from Imperial. So is his opponent. 4TC boom with 35 Voyagers on food versus 4TC with 28, but those are Slavic Voyagers. It's now 9 on stone, so it seems like Pope Leo is actually trying to get that castle up fairly urgently. And this would be perfect time for Leo to move up for the other relic, but he's still not doing it. I am 100% sure that he knows about the relic over there, he just doesn't care, apparently. It's a bit sloppy, because it's not like you need these monks immediately here. Sure, you're trying to push up, but I mean... That extra relic, um, in a long game, could help quite a bit. In fact, it will already start gathering gold for you. So, the longer you have it, the better. And I don't see a reason for Pope Leo not having one of his monks move in, pick that relic up. Or make another monk that picks it up. I feel like, um... Pizarro has done a much, much better job just securing the relics for himself. It looks like we are actually going to have uh, Vos attempted here by Pizarro. He was dropping them in a way that the neutral golds and stones are actually on his side. That's something to point out. That compared to Hideout, on Hideout, the neutral gold and stone can be scattered all across the outside rim. Here, the neutral gold and stone is always here at these berry patches and huntable patches. So, whenever you're rolling, you're trying to roll in a way that you secure all of those. For yourself, there is Imperial Age coming in here for our Turkish player first. And it seems like we are going to have... Um, Hussar plus something. Hussar Cav Archer is the ideal composition over here. We have a camel in the party to take down these scouts over here. A second camel comes in. Obviously, this is going to be... Um, Full camel play from our Turkish player because uh, his opponent is likely going to play Hob and Siege. Castle coming in right now for Pope Leo, ready to click into Imperial in a matter of moments as well, lagging behind by one and a half minutes. It's just one minute actually, so that's pretty fine. Still, I'm actually freaking out about the fact that Leo has still hasn't picked up the relic in the middle, and it, it actually is a very important relic because every bit of gold matters. Indeed, it's Hussar, but Hussar and what? It's Siege Rams. It's going to be Siege Rams in the middle. That's guaranteed. Is the plan from Pizarro simply to have Siege Rams coming in and then just raid the opponent's eco to death with Hussar? That's an ambitious plan, so to say. I don't like Leo's walls here. This is the first thing I don't necessarily like. I think that he could actually get walls up here. And as I said, you don't want to wall out these neutral gold and stone mines. Like, it's going to be a nice wall, but it's a matter of you will need one of these deposits of gold and stone. Either this side or this side. Ideally both. Now, this layer of wool is actually something I like a lot more, and honestly, it's not a bad idea to have double layers. By any means, um, there is the Habadir play from uh, Pope Leo. I still don't see any rams, though, which means that it's going to be Bombard Cannon. Bombard Cannon, Lightcap, what is this game plan for uh, 
Bizarro. He tries to dive in, snap the monks, will be successful doing so. Upon hitting Imperial, he's gonna get the Hussar upgrade for free, but I mean, his upgrades aren't looking amazing, and indeed it's Bombard Cannon play in the middle immediately. It's just Bombard Cannon Hussar. That is an awkward composition, because Hub and Siege should just clap that one very, very easily, and... Oh my goodness! I think that uh, Pope Leo... Oh, this is exactly what happened. Look at this. This was a house originally. We could actually scroll back in time for this. I'm just going to showcase this capture H feature uh, for you to see what happened exactly. So... I'm just going to um, get back a little bit unless uh, capture H freezes on me completely. Uh, so... Rewind time a little bit. And there was the house. So, now what you're going to see is that this house will be deleted by Pope Leo because he wants to add stone walls behind it. And Pizarro, okay. in the moment he sees that house being deleted, he's going to send that monk out to try and pick up the relic. That's crazy. So, the reason why I delete that house is because that's definitely the weak part of the wall. And Pizarro could still try to run past and try to join the relic, tries to convert the voyager uh, for uh, now. And uh, with that, he's actually able to pick up the relic there as well. Um, that's where we were basically in terms of uh, life feed. And uh, we're gonna have that monk. Right. Uh, that monk isn't running back home though. That was a little sloppy and now that Indeed. monk is actually trapped because the other um, vol actually has HP on it. So this isn't going to turn into a big relic haste from um, Pizarro, but it was definitely a nice move overall. So Bombard Cannons are now in, and that means that those walls will go down. Um, this is actually, as I said, a capture age um, issue, because when you actually get to the point where you started rewinding, it pauses for a moment. Not really a big deal, we'll be able to continue from uh, now. And it looks like we're gonna have Stone Wars coming in here for Pope Leo. He knows that he needs to stop this push. The Hobbitier Siege push is assembling on the right side as things stand. Left side seems uh, fairly peaceful. There is a Cav Archer picking off Voyagers. Not really a big deal. The Voyagers are also up for Pope Leo, so he's gonna be fine in the middle. I just don't know what units Pizarro is gonna go for. It's full light Cav. Now it's Cav Archers. Okay, so he delayed the Cav Archer play. Probably he wanted to prioritize the Bombard Cannon numbers. So, Bombard Cannons are very, very expensive when it comes to, like, um, wood and gold cost. Cav Archers, you probably don't want to make a lot of Cav Archers if you want to afford a lot of Bombard Cannons. It makes some sense. These Hussars are actually pretty tough, like, um, especially if you get the armor upgrades in, they will actually be pretty devastating. And you see that the Bombard Cannons also take down buildings really fast. So, yeah, the Harbadier Siege Push is gonna be scary, but as I said, this is all about the timing. If you can't time that Harbin Siege Push well, then you will just get clapped by Cav Archers and uh, Hussar, and that's exactly what we're seeing. There is not enough uh, Harbadiers on the field, there is not enough Rams in the field, and I feel like it would have been better to think about the Hub and Siege push in the middle, because it's a slow push and you want to shatter the opponent's middle instead of fighting on the sides. So, um, this is actually a very, very nicely executed play here by Pizarro. I'm not going to draw any conclusions from this build order, but... Um, you could see that there could be some arena experience involved for Pizarro about this, because this one was definitely more like an arena-style play. We are gonna have uh, Redemption Monks coming in here for Pope Leo with Proc Printing, trying to convert those Bombard Cannons, but the only Bombard... Oh, not the only Bombard Cannon, but um, one of the very few Bombard Cannons that um, the Monks actually have trouble with, even with Block Printing, could be the Turkish ones, if they get artillery and get 14 range um, for themselves. There's a stable here on the left side, and three doing much. One thing that you have to consider is that the gold efficiency is really there for Pizarro. And now we're gonna have Cav Archers. I am fairly certain we will have Cav Archers. Um, it is just Pizarro waiting to reveal those. I think I like that decision for now. You don't want to reveal the Cav Archers just yet. You will need the Cav Archers against the Hobbs, but if there is no Ram supporting the Hobbadiers, the Cav Archers will just simply eat the Hobbadiers. We are gonna have uh, six ranges worth of Cav Archer production now. And the only thing that is missing is, for example, Botkin Arrow even for these guys. They don't have Ballistics, they don't have... Well, they do have Chemistry, so that helps a little bit. And it looks like now, um, the tides are turning. 
Pizarro is actually the one that starts focusing on the right side um, with the Trebs. He will actually start realizing that, okay, I need to make sure that my opponent isn't actually able to access all these neutral resources on the right side. Um, he has a detachment of Cav Archers as he's willing to secure the left side for himself. But he also leaves the middle wide open. At least wall it off, bro. Um, party and Tactics coming in before Bracer. Interesting decision over here for Pizarro. He's got um, Bloodlines already, but those Habitators are just eating the Cav Archers. And... Man, it's so awkward that he leaves the middle open. And he needs to be careful about that because... Um, a lot of units could just flood into his base if he makes mistakes like that. With that being said, it's still 66 army against just 34 traps are coming in. And it looks like we're gonna have Pizarro being able to secure both sides. Habadir is still rampaging the eco of the opponent. Here's Sipahi coming in. Still missing Bracer are the Cav Archers. So are they missing Ballistics and... I think Thumbring is something they already have. Um... Right now, however, it's the pure numbers that are actually helping for Pizarro. He's taking a pretty bad engagement over here with, against the Habadiris with the Light Cab. And I don't see any Cab Archers supporting. What is this from Pizarro? His Cab Archers here are just idle. Um, and that feels so, so awkward. So, he has kind of wasted the two traps over here really, really easily. Because... Like, these Cav Archers have been idle here for so long, and he seems like he's having a bit of a trouble shifting gears here. He definitely had the option to um, absolutely de devastate his opponent's eco, but he didn't really live up to that opportunity, to be honest, and I feel like the more I'm looking at this, the more I'm feeling that Pope Leo is gonna have a shot at um, actually materializing that hub and siege push that honestly shouldn't really have happened, because Pizarro should have done a lot more damage with this. I mean, he did a lot of damage here in the middle, um, Leo could come back and just drop a couple of meals to reclaim all that farming space. But there's Onager is coming in now. And Onager Hobbit is going to be tough for Thirst to deal with. Especially if there's um, Monks with Redemption and Block Printing supporting to convert the Bombard Cannons. And also Rams could be a thing as well. Still, we have to consider that Pope Leo is getting pushed off from both neutral um, resource piles. So Pizarro has this one. And um, for Pizarro, one thing that you could definitely consider is Bombard Towers. This map has a lot of extra stone here on the outside, and that's all in the hands of uh, Pizarro. So Bombard Towers would definitely be a possibility over here. Now the Cav Archers have uh, basically all upgrades, uh, now Heavy Cav Archer is coming in. Ballistics is still missing though, which hurts quite badly. Pope Leo tracking into Light Cav now. He also feels a little bit lost, because without the Habadir Siege Ram play, the Slavs aren't amazing against uh, Turks. Those are a lot of heavy cav archers from our Turkish player with Sipahis. There will be onagers coming in a couple of moments, but it's only one or two onagers, and light cabs will actually be pretty decent at sniping that down. If not the light cab, the bombard cannons will. Crabs taking down the siege workshop as well. So they're going building by building. And you also have what I think is going to be just bombard cannons for now for Pizarro, although he could actually consider um, Rams as well himself. Middle is still very, very peaceful, and in my map intro video I said that I feel like this map, if it goes into late Imperial, it's going to play out uh, just like um, Hideout will, and I'm sort of right about that. Players just wall this off and fight just like if it was Hideout. So, it is four traps even from Pizarro, supported by Bombard Cannons. Bombard Cannons don't have artillery right now, as two men so is coming in as well. For Pizarro, fortified wall even for uh, Pope Leo to hold this side for now. He's gonna get an onager out, takes a good shot against this one. And there is artillery for our Turkish player. Um, that would actually make those Bombard Cannons have a lot more range. And that helps quite a bit when it comes to taking down um, the onagers of the opponent. So artillery is actually a very, very good upgrade over here. It's expensive, especially the stone cost is brutal for artillery. But that 2x range for Bombard Cannon... Um, means an awful lot and it's four traps. It's also worth noting that 14 range is gonna be better than the monks with redemption and block printing having just 12. So while normal bombard cannons could be a bit easier converted with monks that also have 10 range or 12 range, um, artillery bombard cannons are also harder to convert because they outrange monks uh, fairly well. For now, there is gonna be a bombard cannon as well that's not really willing to take down the onager as I'm saying that it's gonna go for it finally. But I feel like the right side is where we should really focus our um, efforts. 
65 military against 25 double actually triple the army value even the voyager count is still decent for pope leo but he's gonna have nowhere to go pretty soon because he's gonna get uh, his right side and left side collapsed at the same time and pope leo calls the gg pizarro wasn't a super clean game from him but definitely the best game so far from him he didn't go for a free tc boom although he technically went for a very very eco heavy play once again i really wonder who this player is could it be Nikov? Like, um, it wouldn't be impossible. Like, Nikov is a big, big boomer when it comes to building up ecos, and he feels best when he's able to just simply outboom his opponent that snowball games with that. That could be a player to consider. Turks gone for uh, Pizarro over here, and that means that we're actually going to the first home map of Pope Leo, which is either Mudflow or a Cup. So. We will jump into game number four over here. We will be going to Mudflow. And I did point out that, like, I don't think there is a huge amount of people from the pro player scene that would absolutely love Mudflow. In fact, uh, I feel like most of them have really dislike it. But what we're going to have here is a Koreans play for Pope Leo in red pizarro is going to be playing indians in blue so in this is more of the conventional civilization pick here for the shorefish whereas for um pope leo koreans is definitely more about the possibilities post fuel age and the thing is that on mud flow you have to consider that most of the wood is in the middle and that means that you have to fight for this water pipe that i believe and Turtle ships isn't an impossible unit to go for here, believe it or not. It's it's very, very possible. Still, the early advantage will be on the side of Pizarro, and this map is opening up for an aggressive scout opening to do a lot of damage to the opponent. So you see that the starting position is so, so open that um, you can actually do a lot of damage to your opponent with just a couple of scouts. That's definitely something that's um, worth looking into. So with that... We are going to have uh, all Voyagers on Fisho here. No surprise about that for uh, Pizarro. And uh, with that... We are going to have uh, four even on Wood for Pizarro. Which means that we could see an archer play. Indians can definitely go for a fast archer play overall. Whereas on the other side, uh, we are going to have... Uh, three on wood, it seems. Um, make it four, possibly. I think four on wood is a standard that you would actually start with the Koreans over here. I don't think Koreans would play scouts in this one. I would absolutely believe if um, Pizarro would play scouts though with Indians. Like a fast scouts play with Indians is definitely something to um, look into. He has a bit of a fish left in these pawns, but he's obviously going to prioritize the elephant when he has it under the TC. So it, it looks like this is just a house. Villager will be quick walled in because there's a scout lurking around and there is no loom on those villagers. So with that... There is a male coming in on the berries. That's something um, that is, once again, fairly standard for this map. Um, you will just be milling one of your berry patches. Later on, you will expand to the other one. But um, in Dark Age, you're just going to go for one berry patch. Even with Japanese, I feel like it's not worth it to go for um, double berries. But especially with the standard save, you will just play this one really standard. It actually is a little bit reminiscent of Arabia at the start, to be honest. So, fairly standard uh, starts. Um, it's not even a hybrid map build order. Uh, because, oh, that elephant is going to be killed at a very unfortunate spot. Pizarro tried to send the voyagers to the right side to avoid that one from happening. The pathfinding was pretty awful for that uh, elephant over there. And uh, Pizarro's reaction was nice. You saw that for a moment. He actually sent his voyagers to the side. We could actually replay that, but I don't think it's actually necessary. That before the elephant was killed, he actually tried sending his voyagers to the right to avoid that elephant from being killed over here on the outside, but he wasn't fast enough. 
and that means that the elephant was killed in the middle of nowhere. Um, with that, that's indeed an 18 pop feudal, meaning that we're actually going to see a scouts build coming in. Other side, we'll actually have some big wars coming in from Pope Leo. I would assume that what he wants to do is like wall using... Is he gonna wall all, all the way around? That would be way, way, way too much. So I'm really unsure what he's planning to do over here. Uh, and it seems like he's actually going for some monster wars over here, so to say. He's going to be going up at a 20. Pop over all. And uh, it is also a scouts build. Now that is more unconventional from Koreans over here. And you wouldn't just pick Koreans to go for scouts here, that's for sure. So Koreans is for something else then. And that I believe has to be turtle ships, honestly. Otherwise, I don't really see a reason for picking Koreans on such a map over here. Um, nice move from uh, Pope Leo. He actually tried attacking that scout, tried to hit, land a hit, but that wasn't fast enough. Now, this Voyager could be exposed to this scout, and I feel like Pizarro could just turn back and kill that Will. Indeed, that is exactly what he's for. Waiting for Feudal Age, he's even going to have the hill for himself. So that should be one that Voyager, I believe, from Pope Leo. And mm, that indeed is half HP lost for that Voyager, but the Voyager survives. Still, these Vos are overly ambitious, I believe. Like, I mean, this is even too much for MBL in terms of walling, and also the back of your base is wide open. Against archers, these walls would make some sense, because archers take a lot of time to get over here, but scouts can just run around your walls. I don't like this walling for Pope Lee over here. I mean, this part is alright, that makes some sense, especially with this wood line, but this left side kind of is an uh, interesting decision. For now, it seems like he will just partially try to block entry to his base and just play full scout. And the idea probably is that he wants to limit the amount of angles where um, Pizarro can attack from. So that um, he can focus his efforts in one direction. With that, he already has a second mill up on his berries. That is uh, not something that we would see from Pope Leo, who quite has quite a lot of voyage idle time over here, close to this table. So he's very, very busy microing his uh, spearmen and scouts over here. Two scouts actually snuck past. Uh, I believe they just destroyed this part of the wall. And uh, currently Pope Leo doesn't really have the scout numbers on the field to take this fight. Um, and really these two voyagers being idle hurts quite a lot. So if you take a look at the idle voyager time, 320 versus 120, that is a pretty considerable difference. Now Indians won't actually give you anything more eco-wise now that the shorefish is out. So... Basically, that's all the, that you got from this one. From now on, you will just have to play it uh, just like you would with any other civilization. But I feel like um, we have seen the biggest strength of Indians being used over here with the fast scouts play that didn't really get any major benefit for Pizarro. He wasn't able to kill a single watcher for some idle time, but not something major. Whereas I feel like the Koreans' um, biggest advantages will just now start um, showing. And, like, Pope Leo actually wants to wall off, like, 30% of the map here. It's crazy. Who would even go for such walls? Like, this is even too much for MBL. I mean, I understand he wants to wall his base here. But these are some super omega giga walls. Like, even these, look at this. You could just wall in between these two wall lines and wall here. And that would be a slightly smaller investment. Oh man. Now anyways, um, this map, as I said, is open enough for scouts to do a lot of raiding, but you have to ask the question if um, all this walling is worth it for Pope Leo, because by the time he finishes walls, it's gonna be Castle Age, and you see that there is still scouts running inside his eco, so it's not like those walls are actually preventing scouts from doing damage to his eco. There goes the first voyager, I believe. Um, will be traded to two scouts, so that was actually satisfactory, I believe, from... Uh, Pope Leo, because he still has his scouts on the field, could try to pick off a voyager on the berries, jumps the spearman, but that might have been a little bit too ambitious, loses one scout in the process. And we are gonna have galleys for Pizarro over here. Um, we'll see if one of these lower HP voyagers will get picked off, and indeed Pope Leo will take revenge for his voyager lost over there. Uh, disaster. 
He disengaged just at the worst possible time, and by the time he came back, the spearmen were there to spoke to poke down those uh, scouts, and we end with uh, no vultures killed by Pope Leo, and he also is forced to make a defensive tower because of the galleys of his, his opponent. I like this galley play from Pizarro. Um, he only has 7 on food though, 11 on food right now for Pope Leo. And I feel like now that we have 4 walls for Pope Leo, this game is going to stall out a little bit. Although, you have to consider that right now Pope Leo has to send vultures to stone to... You know, get another defensive tower up. Right now it doesn't have a promising uh, wood income. And this is definitely the territory where Pizarro could think about dropping a tower here. Um, you don't even have to drop it very, very close to the wood line. You could even drop it here. It's all about denying the wood line as much as possible. Because the galleys are denying the other one. You will have stone walls coming in for... Um, oh, Pleo, because he knows that those ships are trying to sail through um, here and hit this wood line. They just want to sail beneath the TC. And while archers can't actually survive running past or running into the tower's fire to just camp beneath it, galleys can. Like, few glitch galleys, free galleys can just um, go straight beneath the TC. Even though the TC is firing at them with four vultures, it's not going to do enough damage to sink the galleys. One of the reasons why I believe that this map is a little bit awkward here is because we have seen that um, this mangrove meta has to be changed. Like, the balance. Especially the ships have to be weaker than normal in order uh, for these maps to be really viable. Otherwise, ships will just be way better than land units, especially in feudal age. So... Once again, Galleys will try to get through the pot side walls over here. Leo does have his only wood line over here. Goes for another um, stone wall. Should be good to go, I believe. Indeed, the walls do go up. Looking at the Ecos, both players actually have a pretty reasonable resource bank right now. It should be a fairly close castlage time for both players. Um, we got a couple of Seedmen poking down a house, but it's not really doing much. And... Uh, with that, we are, I believe, going to have Pope Leo going up to Castle Age first. There is uh, no market right now for Pizarro, so even though he could buy himself up, he isn't really able to right now. So Pizarro is going to be a little bit more uh, behind in terms of Castle Age time. Also, has a lot of TC idle time because he's idling his TC to click up right now as he's lacking food. That's actually going to be a lot of TC idle time for him. Ends up being um, 50 seconds, which is two Voyagers worth. And now he is going up. Still, I feel like I'm liking this galley play a little bit more. Although I feel like this is where we're going to see what Koreans can do. For multiple reasons. There will be guard towers. Guard towers would actually be able to secure a lot of ground for you in the middle. And indeed, there come the docks. That was the game plan for Pope Leo with Koreans. I think it was somewhat predictable. But... Um, it's probably going to be Turtle Ship Tower Rush, if you ask me. Because what's going to happen is that Turtles will secure you um, water control. And the towers, the free guard tower upgrade, will actually make it really hard for Pizarro to keep his villagers on wood. And there isn't really a lot of wood on the outside. Like, you don't really want to work with these wood lines with like 10 trees on them. That's just not going to be efficient. Um, with that, Pope Leo is actually getting the first tower up over here, I believe that um, Pizarro does not see that, so he doesn't know that there is a tower coming up here. Even if he knows and even if he counter towers, it's not going to be enough because it's going to be a guard tower, so the guard tower is going to win pretty easily. Um, so this tower is actually going to be great for Pizarro over here, and uh, now that it's Castle Age, indeed, here come the turtle ships. Response from Pizarro should be monks. Early total ships can actually be dealt with pretty easily with monks, but obviously, as I said, Pizarro is going to have other trouble um, to fix as well, namely a tower on his woodland that's going to be super annoying. Uh, and I don't see a monastery just yet. Now, it's always tricky. After um, Red Bull Volo, I believe it was 2, but I'm not 100% sure. I think it was Red Bull Volo 2, Hera versus Yo, a late stage of the series where uh, on Golden Swamp, I think it was Yo going for turtle ships against Hera. And uh, Hera tried converting them and he lost like nine monks trying to convert them. So that could also be part of the fact that we're not seeing monks over here because so far, at least in one of the previous tournaments, monks actually failed very, very badly against turtle ships. Now, turtle ships, the ground attack that they have, they are actually going to just shatter those war galleys. 
um, you see that um, the Spearman is actually doing more damage, to be honest, to that uh, turtle ship than uh, the Vorgalis are doing. But still, as I said, the Cannonball is actually doing a lot of uh, blast damage as well, which means that a lot of those Vorgalis are already fairly damaged. Equal upgrades are fairly similar for both players. Voyager count is the same as well. We'll have a second TC coming in for both players. A little bit of a misclick over here from uh, Leo, I believe, might lose a Voyager or two to this one. Indeed, here comes the first one. And uh, it seems like he has actually um, missed micro this one really badly. Accidentally sent the Voyagers on those uh, Vor galleys. Now, turtle ships can actually control choke points very, very nicely. One thing that they struggle with, though, is range. They only have six range, whereas their opponents do have eight range on those Vor galleys. Nice micro so far, though, from um, Pope Leo, actually keeping away the weak turtle ship from the war galleys still this tower is actually a little bit annoying for pizarro but not something that he cannot handle to be honest and he is um double dock war galley play versus his opponent is only playing one dock turtle ships it's also worth noting that because of this war galley over here propleo doesn't really have a reliable wood income propleo only has nine villagers on wood as opposed to 25 and i feel like 25 is closer to what you want to have when it comes to a Vorgal engagement like this. With that, uh, a nice knight counterattack coming in here from Pope Leo. He actually looped all the way around with those knights, and he's going to kill quite a lot of Voyagers. It was completely unexpected by Pizarro. Um, there is going to be a Spearman here that should, in theory, be enough to clean this knight up, but uh, we're going to have Voyagers coming in here from Pizarro, um, taking down that tower. The tower is very, very annoying right now for Pizarro. Um, and uh, Leo's biggest problem right now is numbers. He's got one army on the field, that's one turtle ship, as you're going to witness the turtle ship going down animation, it's a beautiful animation. 15 army against zero, and it's not like Leo is outbooming his opponent by any means, in fact it's zero villagers, uh, or zero villagers advantage basically. So, three TCs will be the case for um, both players very very soon. This TC from Leo will be added on stone, so we might see castles and potentially um, war wagons in the foreseeable future. And let's see if those uh, galleons just dive beneath the tower. I mean, they do decent damage to buildings, and there is no Voyager's garrison in the tower. Now they will try to jump inside, but they will just get picked off. One of them actually survives. But the tower here goes down, which means that Pizarro is able to reclaim his original wood lines. And uh, it looks like we're once again going to have a little bit of a stalemate over here, because Pizarro's army isn't going to be able to destroy Leo's eco here at the back. But also, Leo isn't dead yet and by any means. In fact, he's gonna be on stone. We could see um, a castle for our wagons later on, potentially. He could even add two more docks and just wait until he gets a couple of turtle ships out. A lot of idle time on those voyagers though, so... Apparently, there are some macro issues hitting in for Pope Leo. That's something that we have seen, I think, in the previous games as well. Um, especially the Slopes game, where his macro wasn't that super, super sharp overall. We will have a Monastery now coming in for Pizarro, going for what is probably going to be just the Relics over here um, for now, because there is no Kirtle ships that's actually left to convert. One lonely camel trying to bash his way through the walls, with Watcher is going to bite the dust most likely thanks to the War Galleys. Or not. Or not. Still, the War Galleys should be able to get through the walls relatively easily over here. Another defensive tower has to come in for Leo. He's lucky he's Koreans, to be honest. And one of the reasons, other than the turtle ships, why he's picking this civ is because he probably knows that his wood lines will be pushed by um, ships. And it's a very, very decent thing to have a uh, guard tower for free as an upgrade, because guard tower helps a lot keeping those war galleys away. Now it seems like we're gonna have a couple of war galleys over here. I assume that what Pizarro wants to play for is wood control. You see that he's sending a couple of war galleys on this side, denying these wood lines. He was doing the same on this side, and I assume this fleet over here could actually be thinking about the same thing. It looks like Pope Leo actually attempted a tower over here at some time, but it wasn't even um, started. Um, here is indeed the couple of sneaky voyagers that were attempting that, but now Pizarro has outposts around 
and with just one camel out in nowhere, it's very unlikely that Leo is going to save those villagers. Um, we also have one camel that was killing villagers over here, now will get converted by a monk. Voyager count now is in the favor of uh, Pizarro. He's picking off villagers over here as well. As I said, he finishes off the verse on the left side. We have some sneaky villagers coming from Pope Leo, and one of the things that you can do on this map is do some aggressive sneaks. So if you get like two stables up here, potentially, then you could actually get a lot of knights into the opponent's eco pretty early on. But this might just be for gold, to be honest, because you see that their gold is running short inside the base of Pope Leo. Still, I think the biggest problem that he's facing is wood control. Yeah. Right now, this wood line can be denied by war galleys. And it seems like this wood line has to be evacuated as well. Vorgal is still without ballistics, but doesn't really matter right now. They will take this tower down. And you see that the wood income for Popolio is very, very bad overall. 11 villagers only on wood. Um, I think he's thinking about the castle now, especially with these villagers being sent to stone as well. I think that castle could go up over there. Try to go for defensive tower as we have two more docks coming in here for Pizarro. Tries to quick walk this crossing to prevent the war galleys from getting through and buying himself some time to get the tower up. So instead of a castle, he decides to go for a tower because it takes way less time to finish off that tower than it is to finish a castle that's being built. So he probably didn't feel confident getting a tower up or a castle up. Still, that's quite a lot of um, war galleys over here. And the other tower does go up, only three villagers inside, though there's a camel as well beating up the war galleys. Sneaky villager is getting an outpost up here, but I think this might even be spotted by Pizarro. Indeed, Pizarro sees the villagers, so he's gonna have the time to react to that. And it right now is still 33 army against 3 villagers, and there's also an 11 villagers lead for Pizarro. He's leading in every aspect of the game, but the most brutal thing is if you look at the resources. He's actually ready to go into Imperial here. In fact, I'm fairly certain that's why that university is actually coming up and the market will be following to balance up the eco. And we're just gonna see Imperial Age. Potentially a castle in the middle could be a thing for Pizarro. Just drop a castle maybe over here and then start tapping down these towers. It would be very, very possible for him. Um, it looks like this camel is gonna be deleted because it's going to fail killing a monk and it's also going to fail getting converted. Oh, we're gonna have a TC attempted here by Pope here. I wonder if he was just... Why was he even doing this? I don't understand. If he wanted to go for extra gold, there is some extra gold over here, but he didn't. Um, it looks like the monks will actually be coming in here to try and convert the camels. These camels have anti-building bonus attack, so they might be able to destroy this polycide wall over here, I believe. There's only one voyager repairing, and indeed, it slowly goes down. Monks will not reach this place in time, and that means the voyagers will go down just before the monks would arrive. Yeah. Indeed, um, there is no way that Pope Leo gets this town center up, which means that this is a TC denied at 90%, or at least close to 90%, which hurts quite a bit. Um, ambitious castle over here from Pizarro with the fleet not being here, and uh, yeah, I am not sure what happened over here, but that tower might actually be able to deny um, that castle. You need to garrison the villagers inside, though. Pizarro is still very close to that castle, indeed. He does have it. He's also getting careening, so... He's gonna have a plus one defense on those war galleys in a moment. And the castle is up, it's going to start taking down those towers. It looks like we will have our red player also thinking about Imperial Age in a matter of moments. But still, he's gonna be beaten to Imperial by at least two minutes or so. This monk is apparently having some suicidal thoughts over here because uh, he just ran into a couple of uh, guard towers. But you already see a potential forward coming in from Pizarro. I like that Pizarro is expanding towards these gold mines over here. Um, as we will see if Pope actually sends some more units to get that TC up, but it seems unlikely. And now the monks will get picked off by the camels here as well. I think at this point for Pizarro, he will probably just add trebs, start trebbing this down and play for wood control. But eventually we are probably going to see camels coming in as well. I wouldn't even be surprised to see another castle somewhere around over here, just play for full wood denial. And indeed, I think it signifies really well, at least the game plan, of Pizarro is shown very very well by the fact that it is an immediate galleon and bracer play. Comes up with a trap as well. I also like the way that Pizarro is actually, you know, I'm scouting the outside. So if you take a look at Pizarro's um, POV, you see that he's got very very good vision. He wants to make sure that his opponent is cornered in here and because there is little wood in here overall, there is very very few resources at this part of the map. So yeah, you have a bit of a goal, you have a bit of a wood, but not an awful lot. Map control on this map is extremely important. 
And it looks like we're gonna have a Hobbadier play here by the Pope. But the Hobbadiers won't kill you or won't kill the Galleons. And indeed, Pope Leo just acknowledges that uh, this game is over. And I feel like he just got outplayed here in terms of game plan. Gonzalo Pizarro was always able to just increase his fleet in the middle pond. And um, by the time Pope Leo got to the point where he actually wanted to add ships, namely turtle ships, it wasn't really enough because he didn't have the production or uh, the numbers to win a good engagement with them. And from that point on, Pizarro was just always able to harass the wood lines, causing a lot of inefficiency for Pope Leo's eco. At the end of the day, two hours, five minutes of idle time against only 40 minutes. And funnily enough, after the first two games, I would have said um, I had some feeling that Pope Leo could be even Viper, but I'm not so sure anymore. Um, in fact, I'm fairly certain he isn't. I am completely lost on these players right now. I don't really have um, any good clue towards them currently. So Koreans are gone for Pope Leo and uh, we will have Indians gone. This was the first pick for Pizarro, so he was really preparing for this strategy over here. Funnily enough, it wasn't Indians winning it for him. So Indians just gave him the boost in early feudal, but really what was winning it for him is that he had a better game plan. So this means that we're actually going to the final home map of the players over here, which is Pope Leo's home map, Cup. Let's see if he can avoid being reverse swept because he was up 2-0 and now um, he's very close to getting eliminated. It's a 2-2 standing. We have Celts. It's probably going to be a Celts play from Pope Leo. And the other side is uh, Aztecs, Japanese. It is possible to have either of these. I think it's going to be Japanese, but Aztecs wouldn't be super, super surprising just because generally they're a strong civilization. And uh, we're going to have Celts versus Japanese, so no major surprise about that one. Um, now, Celts has been a um, civilization that was extensively used in Hidden Cup 3 on this map. It was, at that time, a, basically a Celtic Drush to kill the opponent's fishing eco. It's no longer going to work well because the Celts have lost their speed bonus in Dark Age. So, we are probably going to see a modified version of this one, which is... Uh, a man at arms play so i would expect man at arms from our celtic player although drush fc is not impossible either it's risky especially how open the right side of your base is but in general pushing this map is always pretty hard so the thing is that players aren't really making a lot of land units because they're afraid of the opponent potentially demoing them and it's also like the other parts of your base are vulnerable enough to keep you safe from early aggression so, because of that, even though your base is technically open on the right side, and Fast Castle is technically not impossible, although I still would consider it a little bit risky. The berries here are safe, though, which is a nice one for Pope Leo. Same is the gold. It depends on how you roll the left side. If you roll it like this, and you roll like this, then this is actually a lot of resources at the back. Nice wood lines as well. Also worth um, asking how you roll this side. I would think that your best rolls are from the TC to this wood line, and then in between here. Because that would secure that golden stone and even this wood line nicely. You don't have to wool a lot. This one might be a little bit more ambitious. Would secure a bit more wood, but I don't think that you need those walls. I think this is the best one that you can get. Other side, Pizarro's map actually is a little bit more open. The gold mine on the left side is absolutely horrendous. And the stone mine is alright. Berries, alright as well. So... One thing I've noticed, I'm not sure if this is a consistent bug or is just the way that it always... Or maybe just me remembering these instances, but I always noticed, that was also the case for Hidden Cup 3, that um, the player that is uh, on the right side of the cup always seems to have a more open base than the one on the left side. I really don't know if this is actually consistent or it's just me remembering these special instances. But it's still something that's worth thinking about. With that, we're going to have the first board coming in here for Pizarro. Going for what is basically a premium brush um, with his uh, Japanese. And we will talk about the fact that he's not jumping into a TC. And um, that to me, as I said, is limiting the players to about 4, 5, 6 players or so. Over here, the other player is weakening the board with the TC, which is much more common amongst the players. So, 
For now, it's going to be a premium rush. Let's see if Pope Leo actually sees it. Um, yes, he sees the Barak, so he knows exactly that he's coming his way. He's going to react appropriately. I'm not sure if this was his original plan or not, but um, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. He's going to go for the same rush. The Barak will be a little bit later, but that's not something that's really, really brutal as a difference. Now, this is an interesting house wall, and it's worth thinking about. The thing is that if you build your house wall too close to the water, your opponent's fire galleys could potentially destroy that. But if you actually build it very, very far away from the water and close to the gold mines like this, it could be troublesome because archers could shoot over the walls and hit your gold miners. So I feel like these houses would have been better off if they are like 2,000 more forward. So like forming one straight line with this house. That way, uh, I don't think that the fire ships would have been able to reach a house here, here, or here. But... Um, that way it would secure a gold mine a lot better. Anyways, we're gonna have what is basically a fishing operation with the voyagers over here by Pope Leo. He came in well prepared for this map, um, realizing that I think compared to the previous um, Hidden Cup scripts, um, there is a much higher chance of uh, the fish spawning on these non-water tiles, but also the amphibious tiles. Um, also some idle time here on these voyagers from Pope Leo, not ideal. We will have a dock up. For Pizarro, so he's actually going to mix in uh, a couple of fishing ships. And one of the reasons why Japanese is so strong on this map is because the Japanese fishing ships are extremely hard to kill, and that helps quite a bit when it comes to um, dealing with these early drushes. It's not like uh, just one scout or a couple of militias harassing fishing ships can kill them that easily. With that, we have some crazy walls once again from Gonzalo Pizarro this time, um, going all the way around. I wonder what the plan is here, but those are some gigantic walls. I mean, this gold mine sort of justifies that, as we have a couple more voyagers being pulled here alongside a fourth militia as well, and this is something that was basically the reaction to the fast dock play, and I think it was Gamer Legion, or back then I think it was still Steam Secret, that actually did this. Um, reacting to this... Uh, Pond play is that you drush and you wall the opponent's dock in. I don't think it's actually a strong clue for us because everybody has seen Hidden Cup 3, but this was definitely the reaction to this docking play, and uh, this is actually a harder to wall off situation right now. You don't even need these walls, by the way, because the ships can't leave in this direction, so I'm not sure why he's actually walling it there. Um, as so we're gonna have meals coming in here for Gonzalo Pizarro. Still four militias with full HP for Leo. And uh, we have three only for Pizarro. Now that fishing ship is gonna be completely useless because it's completely unable to access the dock. I don't think that these power side words were needed. But that also means that the villagers can do fishing here. That is the only reason why it actually makes sense to block it. Because then the villagers can't take this pond and just drop off the fish over there. We got a big scuffle over here. Um, scout goes down pretty easily, and uh, in the meanwhile, we still have uh, the fishing eco though for Pope Leo, although these voyagers are apparently having some very, very weird um, special dance over here as they bump into each other. So this is why you're actually having the mill over here, and at the end of the day, the fishing eco is much, much better for Pope Leo. Uh, I don't think that he wants to do fishing on this pond. It's a matter of he pulled these voyagers um, to take the fight, help with the militias. But he doesn't want to have them go home empty-handed. So he's just going to go for uh, the fish drop-off over here. The timings of these are pretty much Drush FCs now. 26, 27 voyagers. Uh, but considering the amount of militias that we have seen on the field, the potential idle time, I'm not 100% convinced that um, this is actually a Drush FC. Pizarro actually going for um, some crazy big walls. That's something that he hasn't done in the previous games, but apparently feels like it's important in this one. We'll have a dock up for um, Pope Leo in this sort of hidden position. Something that Pizarro does not know about, but even if he knew about it, he can't really do much against that. Although there is a dock coming in for Pizarro too. Man at Arms upgrade coming in even for um, Leo, as his wood line is gonna get drushed over here. This could be dangerous for him. Um, he's gonna get another militia in here. I think he might lose one or two voyagers, although nope, he's got the Man at Arms here. And these Man at Arms now get the speed bonus of Celts, so they will be able to catch up with these Japanese militias, and they will be eventually able to take them down. You'll probably use your voyagers as well to fight this one. Nice trap over there. 
by uh, Fitz or by Leo, and uh, I think you just fight back with that Voyager. Really nice cleanup over there for Leo. Some idle time was forced on him, and he loses a Voyager that wasn't or shouldn't really have been the case. I feel like he tried to escort the Voyagers out, but if he just flat out fights it with the Voyagers, it could have been great. Fargali is now out for uh, Pope Leo. Fargali also coming in for Pizarro over here, but he's gonna be forced off from the fish. And one thing that's different between the two players right now is that Leo has a lot more access to fish, and you see that um, starting to show in the eco that he's having. He's able to afford horse color, double bit axe, and the man at arms upgrade. And really, now that he's adding farms, that horse color is actually going to show its power. Plus, he also has man at arms, as I said. He still needs to be careful not to get his um, man at arms eaten by a demo. But now those man-at-arms could potentially run in here. There's already a range out, but Celtic man-at-arms actually outrun early archers, so one or two archers alone won't really do much. It looks like Pizarro won't react to this one, and the man-at-arms will run past. In fact, they will actually do decent damage to that archer. Um, still, the man-at-arms have a reasonable amount of HP. Now they actually eat a bit more damage from the TC, but still, they are okay for um, killing one or two villagers over here. Um, gate foundations have been nerfed, so it's a little bit easier for those man times to get through them, but still not really possible as things stand. So I guess uh, Leo decided that he wants to kill at least one archer with his units over here. A villager fight will be taken here by Pizarro, and he's going to be safe for now. But Pizarro only has four on food right now, and he's going to be without all eco upgrades. We apparently will have a sneaky tower coming up here from Pope Leo, because I assume that that is the plan with that villager. Um, he's floating quite a lot of food, and really, the fishing eco here, for him, and oh, this is so smart from Leo. He's not making a mill here, he's making a dock, because the dock is a multi-purpose building here. It helps drop off the fish for the villagers, and also helps, um, making fire galleys here. And if you look at the resources, as I said, the eco advantage is really starting to show. Because, right now, Pizarro is making fire galleys, he's got one fire galley only. And he's going to try sending that fire galley in to kill the opponent's fishing ships, but the reality is that there is no fishing ships, there's only villagers. This dock is slowly going down, demo raft now will come in. That's something that Leo has to be careful about, a big demo shot could turn things around. And that's a tower that Chinese players love to do, in particular Vivi is one of the players that loves to do a tower like that. I don't think Leo is Vivi, but um, it's not impossible, theoretically. Especially considering that Mudflow is definitely a map where I can imagine VV um, picking that as his home map. So now you have to be careful with that demo lurking around. You don't want to lose two or three villagers to a demo raft like that. But the demo is just going to self-destruct picking off two villagers. That was a nice one. This is why this is risky. It's a lot riskier for um, Pope Leo to just have um, villagers over here. Still, at the end of the day... Pizarro had to idle his TC for quite a bit, so um, there is 50 seconds difference between the idle times, which basically means that um, at the end of the day, Pope Leo is not going to be behind by any villagers, and he also has a much more well developed food eco. Clicks up to Castlage in a matter of moments, and we're going to have a stable coming in for our Japanese player, who isn't really far away from clicking up either. In fact, he's rushing up a market, but um, now this is interesting. It looks like Pope Leo is going to delay his castlage and will actually go for uh, fletching first. That is probably because... No, he isn't missing buildings. Why is Leo not clicking up? What is he doing? He's idling his TC. I thought he was idling his TC to click up to castlage. But he didn't. He idled his TC, then went for fletching. I have no idea what he was doing over there, but that's going to cause him to lose his entire advantage into Castlage to a point where his opponent is beating him into Castlage. I think Pope Leo should have had at least half a minute advantage into Castle right now. I don't know why he felt Fletching was needed. It's not like he was pushed with archers or anything. So, you see, he's just clicking up. He should have had um, this click up one minute earlier, and that's going to hurt quite a bit. Now, with that, there is Docs gone for Pizarro. We also have the walls up completely for Pope Leo as well. Not the best walls, to be honest, and it seems like there's a detachment of archers waiting for um, the opportunity to strike on the wood line. Right now, the skirms aren't here. I believe they're actually chasing them from the back, so they should be able to clean this one up, no problem. It looks like we'll have some galleys coming in for Pope Leo as well, so he actually wants to start harassing these farming space. Um, you also have to keep in mind that because the walls are like this for Pizarro, 
um, he can just burn his way through those walls with fire ships really easily. Here come the archers to push the other side of the wood line. And uh, with that, the skirmishers will just uh, intercept them fairly easily over here. The archers are with fletching no defense upgrade. Same for the skirmishers. Skirm's actually getting the defense upgrade right now. I'm not sure if this is really necessary to be honest because if you're Leo, you will probably consider going for knights and a siege workshop. Indeed, here comes the knight. So I wonder if that plus one defense was really necessary. Even more so, was it necessary to open up the walls here? I mean, he's trying to save his skirm's. I get that. But he just opened up his walls for whatever is coming from that direction, and that's always a risky decision to make. For now, it seems like he's gonna be able to hold this one nicely. But that was definitely a risk that he has taken, I'm not sure if he wanted to take that risk. Here's a scout also trying to take this tower down. Right now, um, crossbows will be on the way by uh, Pizarro. There's no ships on this pond, so they can safely cross over here. And... Uh, we're gonna have knights from the Pope, probably Defensive Siege Workshop is gonna be the name of the game for him. We will see what he's up to. Crossbows once again will try to hit this part of the opponent's eco. And you have to keep in mind this wall is still open. I'm not necessarily a fan of leaving that open like that, because the crossbows, if they march into your base, you could lose a game. Uh, with that, it's gonna be free TCs for Pizarro, so once again he's gonna go for a full boom approach. Something that he has done in quite a lot of the previous games, to be honest. And those mostly will launch the games for him. Although, if you think about even the bypass game, he just went for crazy booms. And I'm thinking hard on who would be a player that just prioritizes booming this much. And I really don't know. And I also really dislike this opening. This could lose a game for Pope Leo. And I did question if opening up your walls is a good idea. Even more so, I'm questioning if leaving that hole like that is open. Because you never know what's coming your way here. And right now... Even if he doesn't lose a lot of villagers, that's gonna be a lot of idle time, man. And this would have been so, so easy to avoid. One villager goes down. This is a 70, almost $70,000 tournament. It might even be more than $70,009 in terms of price pool. In a decider game, you make a mistake like that, that's a disaster. And now the knights will come in here. And the thing is that Leo is actually having a tough time cleaning this one up. If he loses the game based on this, it's all his fault. And I feel like he's actually falling apart like that. Oh my goodness. This is... I don't like calling games throws, but this could be a massive throw. Because he was pretty much in this game. But for whatever reason, he opened up his walls. And you can still see that he's struggling to clean this one up. To a point where it's like one hour idle time already for his villagers. Whereas his opponent is on 20 minutes. Sure, he will try to clean this up, but look at this. Um, there is knights over here as well, crossbows will still be jumping around, it's a cleanup, but it's 6 vultures deficit and look at the idols, there's like 20 idols everywhere inside TCs on the farming eco. This push here with a couple of crossbows and knights did way more damage than what it was supposed to be doing. That being said, Pope Leo's army actually is still more valuable, some of it is only fire ship though, but he's still build it, burning down buildings like that barracks, which helps when you actually just want to go for knights, especially um, against Japanese that have great pikemen. The tower here is still standing, so it is denying that wood line. But Pizarro is on free TCs. There is going to be a forward siege workshop from Leo, who is also playing on free TCs. Now Revo was that one. So he's still pretty much in this game. But that was an enormous risk that he took opening up that wall, and it backfired really badly. I think it was fairly obvious it backfired really badly. Um, the workshop coming in here. For Leo, um, he's gonna have uh, Manganos coming soon, and that's uh, a bit of a concern, I believe, for Pizarro, because I'm not sure how he's gonna react to that. So far, he's just booming. Um, he is on stone with free, but that's not going to be enough for the Pansive Castle anytime soon. Picking up relics right now, tries to get a conversion on the Fire Galleys. Redemption Monks could be a way to defend against this one, as his eco has a steady lead, 7 Voyagers. Um, no Vilbar on either side, but he's got Boso, whereas his opponent does not. And uh, honestly, if you are Pizarro, you could consider getting a fire ship out here to this little pond and burning your way through this one. Mainly because if you open up this dock, you will have the option to go for demos, which is always a sort of a threat um, for whoever is actually on these ponds. A little bit um, of an overextension, so to say, from uh, Pizarro, who actually gets a conversion on a fire ship here. So uses that to take down another one. 
but you don't really want to go to the water right now if you're Pizarro. Um, so, three TCs, as things stand by Leo, who is also adding a monastery right now. And no siege coming in for Leo. This is one of the things that I don't like about this map. I'm not saying it's bad, I just say that this is something I don't like about this map. I feel like this is the time where the game just stalls out, pretty much. I feel like it's so, so hard to finish off an opponent on this map that, in many cases, um, even if one player has a decisive advantage, I feel like the game is just way too easy to stall out. And that's something that we're seeing a little bit off over here. Now the crossbows are actually bashing their way through here on the power side. Um, Leo was actually busy microing this fight over here, but he lost two fire galleys to a conversion. Now, Leo needs to be careful with those moonwalking fire galleys because suddenly this pawn could be under the control of Pizarro and uh, Pizarro could be taking over on this pawn with galleons potentially and well not galleons right now but later on and those actually would be capable of shelling the shoreline over here pretty nicely so that's still a threat even though Pope Leo has the lead in score I feel like I'm starting to like Pizarro's position more and more especially now that he's on 4 TC's booming and we have seen how good this player can be if he's allowed to go for a full boom that was basically the bypass game it's a matter of do you allow that boom to happen it seems like um, most of Pizarro's um, home maps actually was um, suitable for such a booming, although Slopes was definitely questionable, as he's also picking up relics right now, he could pick this one up as well. He will be sitting on free relics after that, Scout tries to snap down the Monk and will be successful doing so, nice move over there from uh, Leo. Now crossbows are coming in, and I assume that the plan is to try and deny those docks because we're gonna have docks coming in here from a Leo as well. Both players are actually getting closer to Imperial Age, but I would think that Pizarro is gonna have the upper hand in there. Um, he's gonna have uh, the War Galley upgrade coming in. These Fire Galleys have been converted, so that's why they are not Fire Ships. A um, little bit of a bad fight over here from Pizarro in the meanwhile. Loses the majority of those Knights over here. That's a lot of Knights from Leo, but he has to be careful to potential demos. Let's see if there's a demo coming in or not. Um, it seems like it's a full War Galley play, and you have to keep in mind that post-Imperial, um, Japanese Galleons will beat um, the Celtic combat ships overall, but Celts can always go for Rams on this one. There was a demo um, that actually is really unfortunate for Pizarro. What he probably does is that he selected all docks with select all dock hotkey and he queued up one demo, but it was actually queued up in this building. And that means it's actually unable to exit right now. Um, if he was paying attention to this screen, he would have um, seen this and uh, he probably would have actually... Um, just use those war galleys to attack this wall, take it down, and then the demo can actually run out. Um, in fact, the input advantage is actually going to be pretty big for uh, Pizarro over here. He clicked up just now. His opponent is still fairly far away from Imperial Age, as the monk is going to get burnt alive. There is going to be the demos coming in, though, in a moment. Not an ideal fight for Pizarro. And there is the castle drop coming in for Leo, but this could be the ultimate demo hits, and the knights won't really have a lot of places to go. And uh, wasn't really the most beautiful hit ever, but it was actually a very, very good hit. And you see that Leo has to cancel that castle, go for a much, much more passive castle. He even has a forward TC coming in here on this gold mine to, you know, make it a little bit harder for his opponent to secure that gold mine for himself. Still. Leo is not going into Imperial, which is a disaster for him now. I feel like he needs to get into Imperial really soon. Because otherwise, what's gonna happen is that his opponent is just gonna go for Galleon and trap this castle down. Now this map, as I said, is definitely a map that can stall out for long. So getting beaten to Imperial is not the end of the world on this map because it is just so, so hard to finish a player off on this map. And I feel like uh, Leo will definitely have his chance at at least getting into Imperial. He's not gonna get overrun before that um other than that we will have a 14 on stone for uh, pizarro and that means that uh, he is gonna be dropping a second castle pretty soon he's up to imperial in 20 seconds and we're gonna have japanese light cap now japanese light cap is pretty potato um it's more about just full rating he probably sees that he's floating 1300 food and says okay I'm going to go for some raids. It also is worth pointing out that uh, whoever Leo is, is using manual farmer reseeding because he's running out of farms over here. 
and finally he's going to free that dog that's exactly what you need just take down one policide preferably two just to make sure that it's easier for your ships to move out seizure workshop goes down as well and uh traps should be queued up immediately here for pizarro indeed that is the case and the thing is that Celts don't have anything going for them on water, not even fast fires. You see that um, we're actually going to have what is going to be a hub and siege push. The thing is that you could still launch a good hub and siege push from this angle because one thing that makes Cup unique is that even if you have the big pond, the other side of the map is completely um, open for the opponent to launch a counterattack at. It's going to be a couple of knights diving in here, only plus one defense, no bloodline, so they won't really do much here with the TC fire getting some uh, kills although nice move from Leo to find Mango where the TC fire can't immediately help and he will pick off one or two voyagers here at the end so Japanese light cap is pretty potato um, because they are lacking the plus four defense um, and that means that even voyagers grace on the inside TCs can actually do a lot of damage to them but this is what I was talking about the ships on this map have limited mobility because they are restricted to one pond and you see that there is actually a sneaky forward position over here with what is going to be probably just rams and the champions and the thing is that even if um like even if leo loses this position here it's fine for him because he can go for this gold mine he can go for this gold mine so he still has gold to work with right Yes, he's going to lose some parts of his eco, that's totally true, but those galleons will be so much restricted to this spawn that if he can just pretty much play a little bit of a Scorched Earth Tactics, just leave this part of his base to die and fall back a little bit deeper to the land, he can actually launch a nice counterattack, and that's exactly what he's going for. Don't count out Pope Leo just yet, even though there is a 1000 score difference, but as I said, the galleons are really restricted to these spawns over here, and other than that, there is no military on the field, basically, for Pizarro. He's got uh, three light cav, uh, one samurai, and uh, I believe one crossbowman. So, that's really not much. And as I said, this map is definitely great for uh, dragging out games. And that's exactly what we're seeing over here. As uh, so we're gonna have a castle drop from uh, Pizarro. I think the biggest problem that Leo is facing right now is that this push isn't devastating. It's a couple of swordsmen. And yeah, it looks scary, but I mean, it's one capped ram. It seems like um, Leo is actually struggling to afford making a big push happen. And I feel like this actually hurts him more than it actually helps. He's going to kill a couple of villagers, sure, but this gives time for Pizarro to react. And you're actually going to react to this one with Samurai. Samurai will probably still eat the Celtic Swordsman, or at least trade relatively evenly with them. And you're also pushing the opponent on the other side. You will trap around TCs, which means that your opponent has to rebuild. It's not over yet, but I feel like this push needed to be a lot bigger for Pizarro to actually have an effect. Like, with Siege Rams, with multiple Siege Rams. Now, there isn't really a lot of units on the field here for Pizarro though, to defend the land. It's still 38 military, but most of them are war galleys. We're gonna have some light calves raiding um, the eco of Leo. He's going to get a TC up to defend those Vogers. As I said, he's gonna have to fall back all the way to these corners. And now the champions are coming in. Defensive castle on the way for Pizarro. And, as I said, the lack of rams is actually concerning here for uh, Leo, who is getting arson. I mean, it's nice and everything, but I feel like it's he's losing his base faster than he's actually killing the opponent's base. If this was 10 siege rams with a 20, 200 swordsman or champion, I would say it's fine. But just two rams, especially against the Japanese player that does have reasonable samurai now, the samurai will be able to keep this one back. And if you um, look at the other side, there is actually TCs going down now, and even though there is always space to fall back on this map, I feel like the problem is that um, soon um, you're gonna have nowhere to go, or more importantly, you will just lose your base faster than you can rebuild it. And the thing is that Samurai are also amazing at protecting these traps, because the Void Raiders, um, they will have to dive in. The Void Raiders have the mobility advantage over Samurai, but Samurai will just eat Void Raiders in close combat. These are elite samurai now with reasonable upgrades as well, so it's not like you just send a couple of void raiders to kill those traps with. Just a couple of samurai will just absolutely tear apart those void raiders, but uh, Pope Leo knows exactly that this is over, wishes good luck to the opponent, and uh, Pope Leo the first exits the tournament, and he got reverse swept. In the first two games he was dominating Pizarro, but then Pizarro 
just um, was able to overcome his early struggles. He played a very, very eco-heavy game, super boomy in all of the games that he has played, basically, with the exception of the Mudflow game, I believe. But still, he was able to prevail. I feel like the difference was that in the first two games, um, Pope Leo could punish the boom really, really well with Slopes and Arabia. Here on this map and on Bypass, that boom wasn't uh, punished. It was a little bit questionable to have... Um, Pizarro picking uh, Slopes as his home map for what boomy game that he tried to play. So, in retrospective, that could have been a different map. But, honestly, I'm a little bit uh, torn on these players. I don't really know who these players could be. Pizarro isn't weakening the board with the TC, which is a strong clue for us um, and limits the amount of possible players. But we will need to see the next round as well. For Pizarro, for Popplio, hard to say, really. I don't. I don't really have a good guess on this. Could be Viles, maybe. But I honestly don't have any strong idea about Pope Leo. So I guess Pope Leo is going to be decided by who are the other players and whoever is left is going to be Pope Leo. With that, Gonzalo Pizarro advances to the next round of uh, Hidden Cup 4. Pope Leo is going to be out here after two wins in a row. Um, he's going to lose three straight, and Gonzalo Pizarro keeps his hopes alive for the title of uh, Hidden Cup 4 champion.